Hello families! We are the Behavioral Health and Management Team at Washoe County School District's MTSS Department. That stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. We are looking forward to helping you navigate this difficult time while at home with your children. We want to support you and your family to set your students up for success. Here are five strategies to support positive behavior and a smoother educational experience for your students at home. First, create routines and structures within your home. Most children have very predictable Hello families! We are the Behavioral Health and Management Team at Washoe County School District's MTSS Department. That stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. We are looking forward to helping you navigate this difficult time while at home with your children. We want to support you and your family to set your students up for success. Here are five strategies to support positive behavior and a smoother educational experience for your students at home. First, create routines and structures within your home. Most children have very predictable routines at school. An extended time at home may be difficult for some children without a solid structure. Organize your day so your children know what the day will look like. Include chores, learning time, puzzle time, outside time, and choice activities. Let your children choose what activity they may want to engage in. Any way you can make the schedule visual would also be very helpful. For ideas on creating a schedule with children of varying ages, visit the CDC website. You can find links to our recommended resources and websites in the description below. Second, try the 5 to 1 strategy. Students are experiencing stress with what is going on in the world, as well as adapting to the changes of learning at home. Parents are also in a new role, and their expectations are different. Students are also struggling with this change and may act out in different ways. In this strategy, you give attention to the behavior you want to see to allow students to learn what is expected. It's easy to give attention to the behavior you don't want, but this often increases that behavior. Give positive attention when your children are behaving well five times more often than correcting their bad behavior. This helps move them in the right direction. You can find examples on the district website. Third, be specific with praise. It is often easy to give a good job here and there, but when you are specific, you give your children a more accurate view of what to work on. State clearly what the child is doing correctly and the positive effect that has. An example of this would be, when your child gets right to work on their schoolwork without you having to ask, you could say, I saw you get right on the computer to work on your math, and that is awesome. You can also add a more personal note such as, I know math has been a difficult subject for you to master through this digital learning time, and you are working hard at it. It is important for the feedback to be genuine, so that children hear that you really mean it. Good practice for this is, anytime you notice someone in your household doing something helpful, give them specific praise. Try it for yourself, too. Fourth, brain breaks are another strategy to help you and your child throughout the day. Children have difficulty sitting for extended amounts of time and need breaks to get up and move. Brain breaks help kids self-regulate and manage their emotions when they begin to get frustrated. It helps them recognize when they might need a break. They can reduce stress and frustration while increasing attention and productivity. Some examples are jumping jacks, deep breathing exercises, and stretching. GoNoodle.com has tons of videos that are really fun for both kids and parents. Also check out understood.org. A fifth strategy is one often used in the classroom but which can easily be used at home. Teachers often use reinforcement for students to complete tasks or to maintain appropriate behavior. For example, make a contract that if the student completes three assignments, they will earn 30 minutes of digital time. Or use visuals, such as putting a marble in a small jar each time the student is on task. Then the student earns a treat once the jar is full. Remember to keep it age and individual appropriate. Little guys can't keep quiet and on task for much more than 10 to 15 minutes without needing a break, where many older students can focus for 45 minutes. Make sure rewards are something they want and are motivated to work towards and can understand clearly how to achieve it. Have fun with this. Children and parents too need to relax and recharge. Play games, do puzzles, or cuddle up and read a book. Go outside for a walk and enjoy the fresh air. Cook a meal together. This is a difficult time for the whole world and we must remember to meet our basic needs as a family. 
Be sure to check the links in the descriptions below for plenty of resources to help yourself and your family. If you would like any additional supports during this time, please reach out to us. You can email us at mtss at washoeschools.net or call our hotline at 775-337-7566. Hello families, we are the Behavioral Health and Management Team at Washoe County School District's MTSS Department. That stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. We are looking forward to helping you navigate this difficult time while at home with your children. We want to support you and your family to set your students up for success. Here are five strategies to support positive behavior and a smoother educational experience for your students at home. First, create routines and structures within your home. Most children have very predictable routines at school. An extended time at home may be difficult for some children without a solid structure. Organize your day so your children know what the day will look like. Include chores, learning time, puzzle time, outside time, and choice activities. Let your children choose what activity they may want to engage in. Any way you can make the schedule visual would also be very helpful. For ideas on creating a schedule with children of varying ages, visit the CDC website you can find links to our recommended resources and websites in the description below. Second, try the 5 to 1 strategy. Students are experiencing stress with what is going on in the world, as well as adapting to the changes of learning at home. Parents are also in a new role, and their expectations are different. Students are also struggling with this change and may act out in different ways. In this strategy, you give attention to the behavior you want to see to allow students to learn what is expected. It's easy to give attention to the behavior you don't want, but this often increases that behavior. Give positive attention when your children are behaving well five times more often than correcting their bad behavior. This helps move them in the right direction. You can find examples on the district website. Third, be specific with praise. It is often easy to give a good job here and there, but when you are specific, you give your children a more accurate view of what to work on. State clearly what the child is doing correctly and the positive effect that has. An example of this would be, when your child gets right to work on their schoolwork without you having to ask, you could say, I saw you get right on the computer to work on your math, and that is awesome. You can also add a more personal note such as, I know math has been a difficult subject for you to master through this digital learning time, and you are working hard at it. It is important for the feedback to be genuine so that children hear that you really mean it. Good practice for this is, anytime you notice someone in your household doing something helpful, give them specific praise. Try it for yourself, too. Fourth, brain breaks are another strategy to help you and your child throughout the day. Children have difficulty sitting for extended amounts of time and need breaks to get up and move. Brain breaks help kids self-regulate and manage their emotions when they begin to get frustrated. It helps them recognize when they might need a break. They can reduce stress and frustration while increasing attention and productivity. Some examples are jumping jacks, deep breathing exercises, and stretching. GoNoodle.com has tons of videos that are really fun for both kids and parents. Also check out understood.org. A fifth strategy is one often used in the classroom, but which can easily be used at home. Teachers often use reinforcement for students to complete tasks or to maintain appropriate behavior. For example, make a contract that if the student completes three assignments, they will earn 30 minutes of digital time. Or use visuals, such as putting a marble in a small jar each time the student is on task. Then the student earns a treat once the jar is full. Remember to keep it age and individual appropriate. Little guys can't keep quiet and on task for much more than 10 to 15 minutes without needing a break where many older students can focus for 45 minutes. Make sure rewards are something they want and are motivated to work towards and can understand clearly how to achieve it. Have fun with this. Children and parents too need to relax and recharge. Play games, do puzzles, or cuddle up and read a book. Go outside for a walk and enjoy the fresh air. Cook a meal together. This is a difficult time for the whole world and we must remember to meet our basic needs as a family. 
Be sure to check the links in the descriptions below for plenty of resources to help yourself and your family. If you would like any additional supports during this time, please reach out to us. You can email us at mtss at washoeschools.net or call our hotline at 775-337-7566. Hello families, we are the Behavioral Health and Management Team at Washoe County School District's MTSS Department. That stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. We are looking forward to helping you navigate this difficult time while at home with your children. We want to support you and your family to set your students up for success. Here are five strategies to support positive behavior and a smoother educational experience for your students at home. First, create routines and structures within your home. Most children have very predictable routines at school. An extended time at home may be difficult for some children without a solid structure. Organize your day so your children know what the day will look like. Include chores, learning time, puzzle time, outside time, and choice activities. Let your children choose what activity they may want to engage in. Any way you can make the schedule visual would also be very helpful. For ideas on creating a schedule with children of varying ages, visit the CDC website you can find links to our recommended resources and websites in the description below. Second, try the five to one strategy. Students are experiencing stress with what is going on in the world, as well as adapting to the changes of learning at home. Parents are also in a new role and their expectations are different. Students are also struggling with this change and may act out in different ways. In this strategy, you give attention to the behavior you want to see to allow students to learn what is expected. It's easy to give attention to the behavior you don't want, but this often increases that behavior. Give positive attention when your children are behaving well five times more often than correcting their bad behavior. This helps move them in the right direction. You can find examples on the district website. Third, be specific with praise. It is often easy to give a good job here and there, but when you are specific, you give your children a more accurate view of what to work on. State clearly what the child is doing correctly and the positive effect that has. An example of this would be, when your child gets right to work on their schoolwork without you having to ask, you could say, I saw you get right on the computer to work on your math, and that is awesome. You can also add a more personal note such as, I know math has been a difficult subject for you to master through this digital learning time, and you are working hard at it. It is important for the feedback to be genuine so that children hear that you really mean it. Good practice for this is, anytime you notice someone in your household doing something helpful, give them specific praise. Try it for yourself too. Fourth, brain breaks are another strategy to help you and your child throughout the day. Children have difficulty sitting for extended amounts of time and need breaks to get up and move. Brain breaks help kids self-regulate and manage their emotions when they begin to get frustrated. It helps them recognize when they might need a break. They can reduce stress and frustration while increasing attention and productivity. Some examples are jumping jacks, deep breathing exercises, and stretching. GoNoodle.com has tons of videos that are really fun for both kids and parents. Also check out understood.org. A fifth strategy is one often used in the classroom but which can easily be used at home. Teachers often use reinforcement for students to complete tasks or to maintain appropriate behavior. For example, make a contract that if the student completes three assignments, they will earn 30 minutes of digital time. Or use visuals, such as putting a marble in a small jar each time the student is on task. Then the student earns a treat once the jar is full. Remember to keep it age and individual appropriate. Little guys can't keep quiet and on task for much more than 10 to 15 minutes without needing a break, where many older students can focus for 45 minutes. Make sure rewards are something they want and are motivated to work towards and can understand clearly how to achieve it. Have fun with this. Children and parents too need to relax and recharge. Play games, do puzzles, or cuddle up and read a book. Go outside for a walk and enjoy the fresh air. Cook a meal together. This is a difficult time for the whole world and we must remember to meet our basic needs as a family.
Be sure to check the links in the descriptions below for plenty of resources to help yourself and your family. If you would like any additional supports during this time, please reach out to us. You can email us at mtss at washoeschools.net or call our hotline at 775-337-7566. Hello families, we are the Duke County School District's MTSS department. That stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. We are looking forward to helping you navigate this difficult time while at home with your children. We want to support you and your family to set your students up for success. Here are five strategies to support positive behavior and a smoother educational experience for home. First, create routines and structures within your home. Most children have very predictable routines at school. An extended time at home may be difficult for some children without a solid structure. Organize your day so your children know what the day will look like. Include chores, learning time, puzzle time, outside time, and choice activities. Let your children choose what activity they may want to engage in. Any way you can make the schedule visual would also be very helpful. For ideas on creating a schedule with children of varying ages, visit the CDC website. You can find links to our recommended resources and websites in the description below. Second, try the 5 to 1 strategy. Students are experiencing stress with what is going on in the world, as well as adapting to the changes of learning at home. Parents are also in a new role, and their expectations are different. Students are also struggling with this change and may act out in different ways. In this strategy, you give attention to the behavior you want to see to allow students to learn what is expected. It's easy to give attention to the behavior you don't want, but this often increases that behavior. Give positive attention when your children are behaving well five times more often than correcting their bad behavior. This helps move them in the right direction. You can find examples on the district website. Third, be specific with praise. It is often easy to give a good job here and there, but when you are specific, you give your children a more accurate view of what to work on. State clearly what the child is doing correctly and the positive effect that has. An example of this would be, when your child gets right to work on their schoolwork without you having to ask, you could say, I saw you get right on the computer.
Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you so much, Principal Carroll, and thank you for hosting us in the home of the railroad rotors. And I'm not going to attempt the whistle. So. <laughs> All right. Um, for our action to adopt the agenda, I do have a request um, from our staff. Uh, request to move agenda item 4.01 uh, directly following this action to adopt uh, the agenda. So moved. I have a motion by Trustee Simon Holland, a second by Trustee Manetto. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. So that does then take us to agenda item 4.01, one of our favorites of the year. Uh, this is presentation from students attending various schools throughout the Washoe County School District on their experiences from their first day of school. Uh, this is a presentation only, and I would like to ask our Deputy Superintendent, Deborah Byersdorf, to uh, get us started and introduce our guests. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so very much, President Raymond, Superintendent McNeil, and trustees. Again, Deborah Byersdorf, and I'm proud to serve as the Deputy Superintendent County School District. So this is a treat today. It's a time every year that we look forward um, and a little bit different this year because this year has been a bit different um, since school started several weeks ago. We have five amazing students. They're amazing principals and they're very supportive families um, who are here visiting with us um, this afternoon. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Area 1, Area Superintendent Anne-Marie Dixon and Pulakitas Elementary Principal Don and Gotti to introduce our first student who actually happens to be right behind you up on the screen. All right, good afternoon, Board of Trustees. Thank you for having us. I am here to introduce Mr. Don and Gotti, Principal of Pulakitas Elementary School. Good afternoon, President Raymond, Vice President Taylor, Superintendent McNeil, Don and Gotti, Principal of Polakitas. Um, I'd like to introduce to you today um, one of our third grade teachers, Leticia Sheldon. She is one of our distance learning teachers along with her student, Kalia Craig, and we're working on getting Kalia connected, I believe. And also um, Nicole Craig, Kalia's mom, to talk a little bit about their experience as they started the school year off on distance learning. Leticia teaches third grade at Polakitas. Kalia is a third grade student in her class, and then Nicole also being Kalia's mom experiences with starting the school year off on distance learning as this was a new um, venture for all of us as well. So Leticia, are you there? <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if we can get Kalia connected, so I don't know if you want to 
move into our next. Yeah, if that makes sense, we can move to the next one, and when yeah. she's um, okay. ready, we can come back to Thanks. speak with her. Hi, Kalia. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing awesome. It's great to see you. So we want you to talk to a little, little bit to us about how distance learning is going for you as a student. And then I see Nicole is there, your mom. So we can have your mom talk a little bit about that too. So Kalia, go ahead and take the floor and tell us a little bit about what's going on with your distance learning and how you started the school year. So Kalia, have you, have you had a chance to meet with your teacher during the day and some of your classmates? Um, yeah. So what's your favorite part about that? Awesome. Thanks, Kalia. And Nicole, talk a little bit about from a parent's perspective. How has the distance learning kickoff been for you as a parent? Awesome. Kalia and Nicole, thank you both very much for joining us today at the board meeting. Ms. Sheldon, thank you for, for all you're doing. And not just a shout out to you, a shout out to all of our teachers that are doing distance learning as well as in person. It's a, it's a big challenge, but you guys are doing a phenomenal job. And uh, thank you for uh, your time this evening. I really appreciate it. Gina Curtis, Area Superintendent for Area 2. Good afternoon, President Raymond, Superintendent McNeil, Vice President Taylor, Board of Trustees, and Christian. Hi. Okay, so I have the honor of introducing the principal at Glenn Duncan, Ms. Katie Weir, who is an outstanding principal, and her student, Noelle. 
Good afternoon, Board of Trustees. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, like Ms. Curtis said, I'm Katie Beer. I'm the principal at Glen Duncan STEM Academy. And I'm going to share a few things from the principal perspective as far as challenges and successes. And then Noelle is going to share a few things from the student perspective. So our challenges so far, I'm sure you've heard. Uh, access to technology and the digital divide has been a bit of a challenge. Changes in enrollment from digital to in-person and trying to minimize the disruption for students who are already engaged in in-person learning. Staff exclusion with limited wiggle room in the master schedule for coverage. Masks, especially in pre-K. Uh, reduced instructional time because we're trying to keep everybody safe with COVID-related pr safety procedures. And reduced interaction between students and staff um, because we're trying to limit our exposure rates for contact tracing. We don't have a lot of the mixed groups that we have traditionally. For example, at Duncan, every Friday, we have kids sit in mixed grade level houses at lunch. That's a wonderful part of our school tradition. And this year, we can't have that. But there are still some successes thus far this year. Uh, everybody is demonstrating tremendous flexibility and, and perseverance, as I'm sure many of you have experienced as well. There's been a ton of patience from students and parents on our new procedures and protocols, including every kindergartner walking to school by themselves on the first day of school. Uh, so that was a huge success. We've had lots of blended learning opportunities. For example, today, my third and kindergartners didn't miss a beat. They had specials, even though it was a distance learning day. Both my in-person students and my distance per students were able to log in and experience music computers and library today. So that's been fun. We have all sorts of new recess games our kids are learning this year that I'm hopeful they'll carry into um, years to come. And as a result, there's very few frequent flyers in my office during the recess breaks, which is exciting. Um, mass compliance has virtually been a non-issue in all but pre-K for me. And my kids are learning different procedures like zombie walking, airplane arms, unicorn arms, all sorts of things. They've been very resilient. I'm super proud of them. And we've still found a way to have some fun. We have a house challenge this uh, month. It's our TikTok challenge for September. And it will uh, kick off the last week of September and culminate in a dance party uh, right before fall break. And then in October, we have a pumpkin decorating contest as our house challenge for our in-person and our distance learners. So we're still finding ways to celebrate as a whole school family, even if we're in different locations. But like many of you have said in previous board meetings, it certainly on all hands on deck uh, this year. So I just wanted to, while I had the hot mic, um, recognize a few people in the district who've really helped out Duncan, but I'm sure this is indicative of everybody as a whole. So Lainey Porter, Ann Warren, and Becky Kurtwright from assessment. They helped me with distance learning distribution, decorating a fifth grade classroom, putting up signs for arrival and dismissal gates, and lunch and recess duty. Adriana Publico from HR, who helped with duty coverage, material prep, and copies. Sergeant Bo Lawrenson, who is actually late to his fantasy football draft because he stayed late to fingerprint one of my long-term subs who's helping with coverage at Glen Duncan. Karen Parishow, our Victory and Zoom grant coordinator for helping with kindergarten uh, on the first day of school. Dr. McNeil for helping me cover in first grade. For our data coach, who was actually covering the first grade teacher who was out, but since subs are scarce, we're getting creative. Uh, Bryn Hall, Kristen Fudget, and Hillary Ray from SPED for helping to cover in my CLS classroom when we were short there. Celine Lewis and Lisa McNeil from HR, as well as Anthony Spots and Virginia Duran from Labor Relations, helping to provide support to make sure that I have all my openings filled and posted on the job board so we can welcome new people to the Duncan family. Vice President uh, Angie Taylor helping me to pass out backpacks. We passed out over 800 backpacks on a Saturday so that students could have supplies if and when we trigger distance. Super helpful on days like today. Dee Hurst, our transportation field supervisor for coming out on a hot day and looking at the curb to see if we could safely move where the bus is routed to help with social distancing and keeping my pre-K kids safe. And last but not least, Lianca Solis, uh, Director of Nutrition Services. She helped coordinate with Junior League and RC Willie to get refillable hydro flask style water bottles for all of my in-person third, fourth, and fifth graders. And since we can't use water fountains right now, that's definitely a huge, huge gift to my students. So um, I know this has been a strange uh, time for all of us. Uh, I actually gave birth in the midst of the pandemic lockdown. So 
My motto this year has been, it's kind of fun to do the impossible, which is a Walt Disney quote. And Glenn Duncan sure is having a lot of fun. And here to tell a little bit more about that is this amazing young lady next to me. I've only known Noelle for two years, but she's been a part of Duncan for many, many, many years. She was also on my student council. And this year we haven't done many student council projects, but last year she helped with quite a few of those. So I'm excited for you to hear her fifth grade perspective. Hello, my name is Noelle and I'm a fifth grader at Glen Duncan. I have been attending Glen Duncan since kindergarten. This school year there are a few things that are tough. Fifth grade math is super hard so far because we are learning how to do it in a different way. Standard form. Another tough thing is staying three feet, three feet away from our classmates when we're lining up. I don't think it is weird to wear the mask. I think it is for our safety for us. One exciting thing that has happened so far this school year is we got Hydro Flask from Junior League and RC Willie. It is nice to have a refillable water bottle because we can't use the water, for, water fountains for drinking. One thing that is special about Glen Duncan is the nutrition services provides lunch for all of our students every day. My favorite thing on the lunch menu is the mac and cheese. Last year for Stuco, we had, door we had a door decorating contest for reading week. And it was really fun visiting all of the classrooms in the school to pick the winner. One idea I have for recess, is for, for recess this year is opening the swings. And then after we're done swinging, we can disinfect them. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I am proud to be Duncan Dolphin. Thank you both so much. Good afternoon, uh, President Raymond, Superintendent McNeil, members of the board. I'm Jen Van Jennifer Van Tress, Area 5 uh, Area Superintendent. And with me today, I have Mr. Dustin Beal, who is our principal of Turning Point and Pass, who is going to be introducing our little Lars here. Check, check. Good afternoon, everyone. So I have uh, the esteemed privilege to introduce Larson, or Lars. Um, if you guys don't know, the PASS and Turning Point program is a special education program, and PASS stands for Positive Approach to Student Success. Not only do we focus on academics, we also focus on social skill acquisition to help students get the skills that they need to be successful in a lesser restrictive environment. So Lars has been doing a fantastic job last year and this year. He's really excited to be back at school because social skill acquisition really does involve in-person teaching. He has recently had 40 excellent days in a row, meaning his behavior has been perfect for 40 days. We are going to be discussing in an IEP meeting very soon here his integration back into the general education environment. So without further ado, I think Lars wants to address everybody. Lars, go ahead. Hello? Okay. Hi. My, hi. My name is Lawson Schroeder. I am in fourth grade at Pass Elementary School. I am grateful to be in my class with my Mrs. Maya and my friends. It is helpful for me to be in class with 
my teacher because she helps me a lot. It is also helpful for me to have structure, which is hard for me to get at home. I thank you and all the teachers for their courage to be in class. Thank you. Wonderful job, Lars. And thank you, Principal Beal. Good afternoon, President Raymond, Superintendent McNeil, Board of Trustees, Joe Ernst, Area 3 Superintendent. It is very much my privilege to introduce uh, Mrs. Gina Leonard, the principal at Sky Ranch Middle School, and of course, Christiana Meister here, uh, one of our superstar students in the Magnet program. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me again, Gina Leonard. I am the principal at Sky Ranch Middle School, home of the Thunderbolts, and we are rolling out there. Um, things are good. <laughs> we are very, very excited to be back in the building. Um, I have a lot of students. Um, we still have over 1,300 enrolled with us, so that's an amazing thing, and it's a really great thing to have them back in the building. Some of our students are able to come every day, some of our students come on the hybrid, and of course a number of them are on distance learning. Um, from the principal's perspective, the most exciting thing is to actually have kids back in the building and to get to do all the things that we've talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks and finally put things in place. Of course, none of this happens uh, without my staff that took everything I threw at them and more dug in their feet and figured out how to do it and they are working their tails off. Uh, the most exciting thing is that when you get to do all that work and then you get to have kids in the classroom and see it all come to fruition is, is where the payoff comes. Um, Christiana is part of a, the magnet program that's at Sky Ranch and so I have six seventh and eighth graders who had the choice to come every day and uh, she's going to share a little bit with you guys about what that perspective is from our student side. Um, again, thank you guys for having us all here. Hello, my name is Christiana Meister. I am in eighth grade at Sky Ranch Middle School. I go to school five days a week with one-to-one -one technology. And some things that have made me like very happy this year is that I can be much closer to my friends now because it was kind of hard to just be calling them all the time. Um, it's much easier for the magnet people, well, for the people that are going five days a week to um, learn because it's just like an easier environment for us. And it's just like really helped us push ourselves to be the best that we can be. Um, getting to class is much easier. Last year it was very hard. Um, and the one-to-one -one technology helps us get our lessons done, especially at home when we don't always have um, computers and stuff that we need to use to learn. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Madam President, Superintendent McNeil, Board of Trustees, Lauren Ford for the record, Area Superintendent. I have the honor of introducing our senior from Sparks High School and her principal, Mr. Kevin Carroll and Ms. Cindy Garcia. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Raymond, Vice President Taylor, Board of Trustees, Superintendent uh, Dr. McNeil. First of all, thank you for uh, hosting the board, uh, board meeting here tonight. It's quite an honor having you here um, and having us also um, 
introduce one of our students who's going to speak about the reopening of Sparks High School. Um, you all look very good in your Sparks High masks, so thank you for wearing those. Um, as far as our reopening goes, our enrollment is about 1,200. Uh, about a third of those students went full distance learning. Uh, the remainder of the students went hybrid, including Cindy, which I'll introduce here in just a minute. Um, I also have a couple of representatives from our school as well, uh, a couple of our administrators, Mr. Robert Alesovich and Ms. Cynthia Waddell um, in the audience. And then Cindy picked uh, one of her teachers to represent, uh, to support her today as well, and that's Ms. Janet Roman, one of our English teachers, who Cindy has for senior English. So Cindy uh, is an amazing, amazing student. She asked uh, how I chose her, and I said, well, I don't choose individually. I ask a team of people, and unanimously, uh, the individuals chose Cindy to speak today. Uh, Cindy is going to graduate in the top 20 of her class this year. Uh, she has right now a weighted GPA of over 4.3. Uh, she's in leadership, super involved in the school. Uh, she was involved in the reopening quite a bit with our leadership students, getting the school ready, um, getting staff teams ready, um, all that fun stuff that starts the school year. So with that, I would like to introduce Cindy Garcia. Hello. Um... I'd like to start off by being honest. I never thought that this is how my senior year was going to start, and it feels really weird. I'm like 50-50 uh, with this start, but I won't let it stop me from enjoying my last year of high school. I'm sad that most of my friends are attending in Group A, Group B schedule, as I am on uh, Group A, but we made it work. We did a mini senior sunrise just for us. We had breakfast right after, and then we went shopping, looking around whatever caught our eyes. And that was one of the best days that I had so far throughout 2020. And we started off uh, doing it safe and fun. And when we started, when school started, the hallways and classroom were a little weird because of how they are set up. I used to how the classroom was set up in groups of four or five, or in rows, but now they're in rows, but way more separate and spread out. And I'm still used to how full the school was, but I do not like how it's not, I do like how it's full uh, not anymore. As I'm not with my friends, I'm unhappy that I won't be able to walk the hallways with them to class or being able to decorate our senior lockers, let alone getting one. But with the hallways, even though it's split in half, like we're moving like cars, it's much easier to get from point A to point B. It's not annoying anymore when we used to have to wait or shove people out of the way just to go to class. Also having a small group in each classroom is easier because teachers can go to each student without worrying if everyone has the answer or not. Teachers can literally hear every student's opinion, still have the time in class. In my foods class, our teacher told us questions about do we have a favorite food or what are the foods that we often make, those types of questions. She got to hear every student's answer. And it's also helpful how teachers are emailing or other ways to contact us to see how we're doing or questions about assignments, keeping us updated like today. All teachers emailed us in Teams, Remind, Zoom, that school was canceled because of the smoke. I'm also a cheerleader here at Sparks High. And hearing that sports were moved to January was heartbreaking for me. But I also hope that everything is calmed down the next semester so we can have our Friday night games and experience our senior night. And, but for now, we'll make it work with what we got now, and that's okay. Like I said before, I'm sure about the school year. There are some ups and downs, but we're playing it safe. We're making sure that we're all healthy, but at the same time, enjoying our school year. Thank you for having me. Thank you both very much. All right, I got the thumbs up that I think that concludes our first day of school presentation. I'd love to thank all the kids, the parents, the teachers, the principals, everyone who made uh, it possible for us to do this presentation under unusual circumstances. Um, and I'll just see if our superintendent, Dr. McNeil, wants to add anything. Thank you very much, President Raymond. We started this project a few years ago, and it really is one of the most special days um, for a board meeting. I mean, all of our board meetings are very exciting and, and 
thrilling, but this is a very, very special time. So I just want us to do a huge shout out to our parents and our students, our teachers and our principals for making this possible. And a special thank you to our area superintendents because this was something else added onto your proverbial platter. So thank you so very, very much. It was wonderful, thank you. All right, I believe we're gonna take a very short recess just to allow um, our guests to leave and bring in a new group of uh, individuals and trustees. We're gonna take a very quick photo for the website.
right, if everyone wants to take their seats, we will get started again. I will call the meeting back to order. The, we are now moving back up in our agenda to the consent agenda. Um, and I would be looking for either approval or if anyone would like to pull an agenda item at this time. Vice President Taylor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I would like to um, just pull for a little discussion, uh, agenda item 2.13. All right, thank you very much. Then um, we'd be first looking for uh, if there is any public comment on 2.02 .02 through 2.04, 2.06 through 2.17. JJ, do we have any public comment on those consent items? We do not. Okay, then um, if there is no other items that would like to be pulled, we can approve 2.02 .02 through 2.04, 2.06 through 2.17, and just need a motion for that. I'm sorry, Madam President, I asked for 2.13 to be, to be. Oh, I thought you said 2.05, I'm sorry. No, 2.13, thank you. Just for clarification, was this the city of Reno, Trustee Taylor? Y yes, it is. Okay, Dr. so Chris, the Dr. city Reno. of Reno, I think, is 2.05. Oh, did I say the wrong? I, I, had, I wrote it down on everything in my notes. My bad. I wrote the wrong one. Well, they both look to have the city of Reno, so maybe you should double check and make sure. Yes, it is. Thank you. My mistake. Yes, 2.05. Yes, thank you. That was my mistake. Okay. So, do we take approval of the ones that we're going to? Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion since okay. I asked for that. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the board approve consent agenda items 2.01 through 2.04 and 2.06 through 2.17. I'll second that. I thought, I thought you wanted to talk about both 2.05 and 2.13. Only 2.05, is that the only one you wanted pulled? It was 2.05 uh, for me, I, I misspoke. Okay, great, then I'll second your motion. Okay, thank you. Okay, motion by Vice President Taylor, second by Trustee Simon Holland. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, then that motion passes unanimously, and now we'll move on to 2.05, which is approval for the grant application to the City of Reno under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act for $2,499,849, and this is for possible action. We are joined by uh, Lauren Olin, our grants administrator extraordinaire, and uh, Dr. Chris Turner, our chief information and technology officer. Thank you, Madam President. And, and I ask for these, and thank you to the team who's here. I ask for this item to be pulled because we're, we're still having a lot of conversation and get, receiving a lot of questions and inquiries from, uh, from parents as well as from some instructors regarding the numbers of the devices um, that we still need and, and students that are on distance learning but don't have accessibility and I mean connectivity and so on. So I thought with such a large amount of money and, and it would be nice to uh, just have the conversation about what this means in terms of closing that gap and closing that loop, if, if you would. So is there a specific question I can answer? No, no what I, uh, Dr. Turner, what I was asking is that to have a, um, a, a little bit of a conversation about, the, I know what, you know what these will be used for, how, how does that leave us in terms of the, the devices that are necessary, um, if there are other grant funds that, that um, 
you know, what this takes up for us, Lauren. I know you've worked really, really hard and looked at every single opportunity. I think it's important for us as colleagues to know, and in particular for the public to know uh, what's being done uh, in terms of securing grant funds, because we know we don't have the budgetary money and, um, and devices so that we're closing that gap for those students that need it. Yes, so thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Taylor, to have this conversation about the grant funds. We're very fortunate to be in a position uh, to avail ourselves of the City of Reno's grant opportunities. Lauren Olin has worked tirelessly with the City of Reno to develop these partnerships and ready us uh, for the opportunity to purchase these uh, extra devices. Um, what our internal um, data shows is that we have 3,578 students that still do not have, do not meet the ideal learning situation in terms of having their own device. Those students have been identified as having a device, either it's a family device or it's a shared Washoe County school device. Um, what this grant provides us is the chance to purchase additional devices to satisfy the needs of those families. What we found is, as this, as, this, uh, as this timeline has gone along during the grant process, you'll notice, well, maybe you won't, I don't know what paperwork you have access to, but as you may recall from some of my previous presentations, uh, we were quoted from our supply vendor uh, a lengthened timeline for the delivery of these devices, sometimes as late as October and even later. But as, as this process has developed, we've identif we initially identified devices that were tremendously expensive, uh, upwards of $1,200, I think, per device. But the prices dropped in half and then cut in third. So now we're at our latest quote with our vendor is $462, which allows us the purchase of 5,411 devices, which will more than satisfy the needs of the students that don't have a device in the district. If I may, Madam President, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turner. So that means, so when we started with 11,000 students that didn't have devices, right, and this, this takes us down to, and then we got to where every household had a device, but not every student, or maybe the device wasn't up to par. So this takes us to every student having a, uh, an, an adequate device? Based on our initial p data collection in the springtime when we first went to uh, COVID lockdown, subsequent efforts at collecting data from families and, and input that we've received through the area superintendents from principals, we've identified that we're down to 3,578 students. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. So until when, when, do, when should we expect the devices to, to come in? I know, that, I know it's lengthened because everyone in, in almost the world is trying to get devices. Um, the, I think Lauren and I are await Lauren's work with the city of Reno. I think this grant has to go through the city, mm -hmm. city of Reno's approval process first. Right. Right. Uh, thank you for the record, Lauren Olin, Director of Grants. So to answer your question, Trustee, Taylor, um, the city of Reno will take this to their board on September 23rd. Once we get approval, we will um, place the order. Um, it, and, you know, we did apply for almost $2.5 million. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much we will get. Right. So, you know, that's all still pending. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, too, is we did write in money to our AV3 grant, which was also um, one of your approvals. And in that grant, there's 3.9 million to purchase computers. And then um, in July, we also had money from 21st Century Learning Centers mm -hmm. to buy computers. And then, um, so there's 4,000 computers that are on their way right now that we're expecting um, probably the first week of October or last week of September. And then once we get the city of Reno approval, we will place that order hopefully September 24th. And we are working with our vendors diligently. And I mean, this has been a team effort with IT, purchasing department, business department, and the grants department to get this um, going. But I think that our vendor understands our urgency and is helping us to get those computers. So. We, 
based on all the data that we're getting from the um, surveys that have been online and then uh, ben Hayes's department has also done the postcard um, surveys. Mm -hmm. We should have enough computers for all children uh, to to meet the needs, not only to cover the children that there was no device in the house, but then also go back and look at, okay, they're siblings. So instead of sharing, let's get every kid uh, focusing on the device. And for the City of Reno grant, obviously we're serving the children in City of Reno. So we're focusing on the middle and high schools in the City of Reno because we know those students are on a hybrid schedule. So every other day they're doing learning. So having mm -hmm. a computer is very important. And within those um, City of Reno uh, schools, of course, there's Hug and Wooster which we know have very, very high needs. So mm -hmm. um, if, you know, <laughs> cross our fingers, if everything goes well, this will be very good for all our students. Thank you for that. Just one, if I may, a follow-up. So, um, so what about this, the schools that are in the city of Sparks? Will so, we hopefully reaching out to them? Right. So that's where AB3 money comes into play. So I've been telling people it's like a big logic puzzle. So we can use City of Reno money for City of Reno uh, schools. AB3 money could be used for City of Sparks and, count, and schools that are in Washoe County. We also have 21st century money that can be used for children that are in the 21st century program. So we're all working together to track it, inventory it, and make sure that the devices bought with certain federal money go to the targeted students that we said we were going to give them to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to just thank you. I mean, Lauren, you do such a tremendous job with grants and the, the puzzle that this is, just to hear you explain, <laughs> there are four or five different sources and just over the last few months to know that 9,000 uh, devices are at least being requested and we feel fairly confident about, I mean, just think about those families and those students that, although it isn't immediate, but it's certainly on the way. Um, so right. just thank you for your work. A uh, huge thank you to the city of Reno for even allowing us to apply you know, for the funds to help close the gap for those students because we don't know what's ahead and uh, how many will have to distance learn even because of smoke, who knew that, right? Um, but then it's just those students not being left behind and that's, um, equity is such a big issue for the board and for us to know that those gaps, especially for those title schools and so on, just the work that's being done is tremendous. And this community has been so concerned, um, which I think is a, is, a, is a great thing about students not having devices and that work that's being done, all those things together is what's gonna help us get to where we need to go. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you and thank you for um, bringing this forward so we could highlight that great work. Any other questions? All right, then I'd just be looking, uh, any public comment on 2.05? No. Okay, then I would just be looking for a motion to pass. 2.05? If, if I may, uh, Madam President, I move that the board pass consent agenda item, passes consent agenda item 2.05 with great anticipation and appreciation. All right, I have a motion by, by Vice President Taylor, a second by Trustee Manetto. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye, any opposed? All right, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Okay, our next item is 3.01 and that is public comment. This uh, is a time for general public comment, not related to a specific agenda item on today's agenda. Um, I know we have a significant number of physical uh, individuals here physically to make public comment. Uh, the room can only accommodate um, a certain number of people. I think we're, we can, cannot have more than 50 individuals in the room, so we will be cycling through people. Um, I know that our um, recording secretary will be reading off multiple names to get people ready so they have time to uh, prepare to come into the room. And prior to that, I believe she'll be reading our email public comments. Uh, anyone who's watching us from home on YouTube can still submit public comment by email, and that email address is publiccomments 
at washoschools.net. The Board of Trustees receives those public comments throughout the meeting and we are able to read them individually, uh, but our recording secretary will now read the names of those that submitted general public comment. We received emails from Kathy Johnson, Katie Wallace, Agnes Coleman, Mike Miller, Barb Giacomi, Vicki Boley, Lori Ziegers, Tammy Callahan, Julie Hitchcock, Rocco Randone, Cynthia Anderson, Van Fortier, Melissa Errolt, Laura Murphy, Tara Hayworth, Chantal Ebonia, and Anna Inuke, Stephanie, Zach Woodhead, Amy Bentel, Amanda Mendenhall, Michelle Rutherford, Sarah Zober, Amy Sung, Adrienne Brown, and Kate Flugoft. Kathy Zarker, Lori O'Leary, Kate Carter, Kaylin Evans, and Jen Leha. You want me to hold it down? Yep. Oh, there we go. Am I up? Good afternoon, President Raymond, Vice President Taylor, Superintendent, Trustees. Thank you very much for having me today. It's nice to be here in my old alma mater. My name is Dave Ayazi, and I'm here just as an introduction. I was hired by the Washoe County Commission to help them as a liaison between the governments for this COVID crisis. Um, they're, I want you to know that their first order they told me just three weeks ago was to help the school district out. And we've been working on that very hard. The county has donated 3,500 tests that I think you guys are gonna start using um, to do day-to-day -day testing. They wanted to really make sure that there was enough testing out there. That was one of the top priorities was to get the uh, time for the testing results back sooner. Those results are coming back very well now. There's a lot more capacity at Renown than we had before. So the testing side of this in this community is going very, very well. Um, we were also supposed to expand the test, the number of tests to the people who perhaps might not have symptoms, but we wanna feel safe in, in their work environment. And I believe that's where you're gonna use those tests for. So I think that's a very good way to move forward to make people feel more confident in the school district. I think your plan is working very well. I did a little math this morning. Uh, if you had 19 cases out of 40,000 children, approximate cases, that's 0.043%. And I think the parents in this county should really be praised for not sending their kids to school without uh, any outward signs of sickness. They've been doing a great job. I would have bet that there would have been a 50 the first day. So I really believe that the community is coming together to help this quite a while. Um, one of the things we also worked on was working with the health district and they have some pediatric, um, they don't call them, uh, they changed the name, the pediatric disease investigators. There are some specifically designed or waiting there for pediatric cases for, for people under 18 who test positively. And they, the health district, wanted to make sure that there was enough capacity there that when children report uh, the sickness that they'd be people on that right away. So you can rest assured that that's, as far as we know, happening right now. We've been helping, the county has been helping the health district hire more people to make sure that that happens and using a lot of their COVID money to do that. 
We've also gotten the school district involved in the weekly COVID updates, and I appreciate the school district for being on those phone calls to get the information right away. Also, uh, Mayor Sheevy's COVID task force, you're gonna talk about that a little bit today, getting involved in what the metrics are going to be like to move forward with this, uh, with this meter. Hopefully, I didn't really like what I read in the paper because I didn't get that sense from those meetings that, that was, it was about that this meter would tell you what to do with your schools. I think in that call, it was explicit. Okay, I think I've got my time out. Thank you very much. Um, if you need anything, you know how to get a hold of me. My job is to help you. So if there's anything I can do, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ayazi. Thank you for making time to share that information with us and for your service, um, not only as a former trustee, but um, in your role with the Washoe County Commissioners. Kathy Zarker, Lori O'Leary, Kate Carter, Kaylin Evans, and Jen Leha. Good afternoon, Superintendent McNeil and trustee board members. Under the guiding principles of the district's reopening plan, it states, all decisions are based on a foundation of do no harm. Do no harm, and yet, the decision deny the recommendation by the Washoe County Health District that schools not reopen for in-person learning. Result, in less than three weeks of full-time attendance, there are 24 positive COVID cases in 22 schools. The decision, take no action upon its own preliminary criteria for closing area schools when failure to meet two of the three criteria indicated schools should be closed and students moved to distance learning. Result, COVID rates in the district are rising daily. The district stated it would work with medical professionals at the state and local levels, yet none of their three data points are being used or calculated by either state or local health officials. The district has decided that the future safety of faculty, staff, students, and their families will now most likely depend upon the creation of a color-coded threat chart this by a little known task force whose previous primary function was public land usage. In my opinion, the decisions made by the district in these matters willfully and inexcusably violate the guiding principle of do no harm. It is time for you as leaders of our district to walk your talk. Do no harm means that you take action you don't stop following your own protocols because they require you to make uncomfortable or unpopular decisions. Most importantly, do no harm means that you stop treating faculty, staff, students, and their families as expendable pieces of the back to school experiment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Sarker. Lori O'Leary. Kate Carter, Kaylin Evans, Jen Leha, Roger Ports. Hello. As a parent in the district and children in the, not in the district, a former special education teacher and substitute teacher in the district, and as a member of the community who wrote to you all last week to submit my name to be an interim trustee in Scott Kelly's place, and I did not receive a single auto reply from one of you to acknowledge my email. I am sickened by what I see here tonight and what I hear from my friends who are coworkers in the district. Agenda item 4.01, which had students and staff speaking tonight, was perfectly illustrates the horse and pony show that this board and this community has given. Several district staff friends of mine have said they were approached to speak tonight. When they said yes, if they could be honest, they were told thanks but no thanks. School admin were pressured, pressured to find positive responses only. The speakers, probably unknowingly, 
were cherry picked by staff to share the rainbows and glitter of going back to school and seeing their friends for the first time since March. All the glitter with a small sprinkling of harmless dislikes, like having to wear masks or social distancing, nothing that is a negative reflection on this board's actions. In public comment, we'll hear the truth, the reality from staff and parents with no cherry picking. I predict it'll be far different than what we heard earlier. You decided to reopen, but didn't have a plan to do so. And you had the most important element of a, of a plan you forgot, which is your teachers. They were telling you to postpone the start date so they could plan, prepare, and recreate a whole new way of teaching so they could do what they do best, which is teach our kids. You didn't listen. Almost four weeks into the school year, and the COVID criteria for closures is still not set to keep our kids and our staff safe. The resources like laptops for all students aren't there. You didn't plan. You didn't put students first. If speaking up tonight is harming my chances of becoming an interim uh, trustee, then so be it. I don't want to be a part of that board if that's the case. Because this community and this board should be honest, open, and transparent. The community wants a trustees who are all of these traits. They want to have the tough conversations that you have not shown to want. Critiques and criticisms cause friction. Friction causes action, and action causes change. We need change in our district. My experience as a parent to date, I have a freshman in a STEM academy, all honors classes. Her first three and a half weeks of school have entailed on distance learning days, checking in onto her computer four times a day, staying present, and then closing her laptop. There has been no stream classes. Today was her first stream class. That's almost a third of the quarter, or more, well over a third of the quarter, already happened with no learning. Ms. O'Leary, I'm sorry, your fault. time is up. This is not the teacher's fault. This is a lack of planning. And I'm sorry you didn't receive a response. I just want to make sure if one of our staff can make sure you have the right email address to send that. I don't remember seeing it, so. Kate Carter, Kaylin Evans, Jen Leha, Roger Ports, Isabel Patella. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Carter and I've been teaching in the Washoe County School District for 23 years. Today I'm coming to you as an employee and a parent. I have two children attending Galena High School who are currently full distance learning. As a parent and teacher, that was one of the hardest decisions I've had to make. Five out of six of my family members are compromised. My mother is a cancer patient and I am one of her caregivers. In the past three weeks, I have worn a mask nearly all hours of the day, not just at school, but at home as well, for fear that I have been exposed and am asymptomatic and could possibly infect my husband, my children, and most importantly, my mom. I have been unable to hug and kiss my family. My husband has moved into the guest room, and I see no end in sight. I became a teacher because I love kids. I've taught for 23 years because I love kids, but I don't love teaching like this. I'm unable to sit next to my students and help them work out solutions to their problems. I'm unable to high five them as they come in and leave my classroom, and I'm unable to comfort them when they're hurting. What we are currently doing in our classrooms is not teaching. What we are doing is the very best that we can do with what we've been given, and we are suffering. Anxiety levels are through the roof. Let's talk about data. When presented with data from the health department suggesting the delay of starting school, you ignored them. The teachers union and principals union spoke to you and told you, you should, we shouldn't open, we weren't ready, there were no solid plans, but you told us to get back to work. You gave us cleaning products with labels that warned of possible death in, if inhaled and made us responsible for cleaning our classrooms multiple times a day. When we pushed back, you took that away and gave us soap and water. Per cleaning guidelines by Johns Hopkins University, the water temperature must be 77 degrees 
And with most classrooms in the district not having sinks with running water, let alone hot water, that is an impossibility. So teachers, like we always do, went out and bought cleaning supplies with our own money. You have set parameters for closing. They've been met. What did you do? You moved them back. You didn't like the answer, so you formed another committee and passed the buck. When does it become the school board's responsibility to run the school district? You demand that as teachers, we use data to drive our instruction. We test, we assess, we test again, and we make decisions on our content based on the outcome of that data. And yet as district leaders, you are showing us that you don't value data. So why should we? Because it is a scientific fact. Yet when you get numbers you don't like, you throw them in the trash. Ms. Carter, I'm sorry, committee. your time is up. You need to be better. Kaylin Evans, Jen Leha, Roger Ports, Isabel Peralta, Hannah Branch. Hi, my name is Kaylin Evans. I'm an educator here in Washoe County and the president of Empower Nevada Teachers. In your email last week, Dr. McNeil, you stated, we have always worked to do more with less. This is something we have done for years. That portion of your email sums up perfectly the biggest issue we're facing, the fact that we are always asking educators to do more with less. This system that we are all a part of has been broken for years, yet the only people who seem to be saying anything about it is the educators on the ground. You're not telling the community the truth. They don't know the realities that our students and educators are facing because those of you with the platforms to do so aren't showing the courage to speak up. By not speaking up against injustice, we are just as complicit as those who are truly responsible for it. Why is the lack of funding and resources not the very first thing you mention every time you're in front of a camera? We actually do the opposite. We thank them. I was at your State of the District uh, address last year, Dr. McNeil, and you thanked the governor and lawmakers for their increase to educational funding. Do you know how much they increased educational funding? $60 per year per student, and it was a one-time influx of cash. Do you know how much we would have to increase per pupil spending just to be on average with the rest of the country? Over $3,000 per student per year. But we're thanking lawmakers for the $60 they provided every student. You know, when you feed someone scraps long enough, they forget that they deserve a full meal. And that's what's happening to us. We've been dealing with this for so long that we're conditioned to it. Maybe Dr. McNeil and some of you on the board, one of your strengths is your biggest weakness. You've worked extensively in this district for many years, but also you've been on the inside of a broken system for so long that you don't know any different. Teacher overages, loss of allocations, that's normal. Huge class sizes, largest in the country, of course. Not enough technology and resources in the classroom, very typical. Outdated textbooks, numerous teaching vacancies, overcrowded schools, lack of funding for arts and physical education programs, insane counselor caseloads, lack of effective student mental health services, high teacher turnover rates, inadequate nutritional services, and livable wage for all educators. This is just the way that things are. And we've accepted it. Through all of this though, educators and students in our community have done amazing things, but the truth is that every day we allow this system to continue, we are doing a disservice to every single child in our community. We are failing them. But there are educators across this state who are, going, who are not going to accept this any longer and are going to do everything in our power to fix this, and we hope that you will stand with us in this fight. Either way, Mr. we're not Evans, backing your down. Time Thank is you. Up. Jen Leha, Roger Ports, Isabel Peralta, Hannah Branch, Sarah Bryant. Is 
it working? It is. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a teacher in Washoe County, and I'm currently extremely overwhelmed with the workload that I've been given as a teacher this year. I have five classes of in-person and one class of distance learning. My one class for distance learning has 80 students in it. Eight, zero, 80. And while I have a provided curriculum through Edgenuity, the reality of distance learning is that I am not able to effectively provide supports for my, the rigorous assignments that Edgenuity gives, especially not when I'm trying to give those supports for 80 different students, all at different levels. But my workload is not what I'm here to talk about today. Along with my teaching credentials, I also have a master's in child psychology. And for me, that is my bigger fear through all of this, children's mental health. My 80 students who are on distance learning are not having their social and emotional needs met. They feel discouraged when they look at their grades on ingenuity. They feel saddened that they can't see or talk to anyone. They feel undervalued when their teacher has barely any time for them. When we did distance learning in May, it was very different. I was able to meet my students' social and emotional needs. I was able to do Zoom meetings and play games with them. I was able to play on spirit weeks and scavenger hunts and have many other fun challenges that kept my students engaged. And we had online counselors who could sit and talk with the students who needed extra support. None of that is happening right now. Instead, all of our worst fears about distance learning are coming true, and we are making distance learning a self-fulfilling prophecy when it does not have to be. I don't blame my administration for this schedule that has led to so little support for our distance learning students. They did the best that they could with the time and resources that we had. And in fact, if I didn't have the most supportive admin in the entire world, I would never have agreed to take on distance learning at all. But I'm frustrated right now. I'm frustrated that our school did not find out who would teach distance learning until three days before school started. I'm frustrated that schools did not receive extra allocations to help with distance learning. I'm frustrated that we had to try to squeeze distance learning classes into a master schedule that was already so precarious. I'm frustrated that people with significant health issues were denied distance learning positions when schools like mine have hundreds of students who could benefit greatly from a full-time distance learning teacher. I'm frustrated that full-time distance learning teachers have hundreds of students on their caseloads. But truly, I am mostly frustrated that we are not even trying to take care of our distance learning students and give them the supports that they need that they so desperately need. Please help schools by providing extra allocations for distance learning positions and by putting an overage freeze so schools don't lose any more teachers than we already have. Let's make distance learning a feasible option for students and staff that want it. You guys all opened schools in August because you claimed it was the best thing for our students' mental health. If mental health is the priority, then let's make it a priority for all of our students and not just the ones who are in person. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leha. Roger Hortz, Isabel Peralta, Hannah Branch, Sarah Bryant, Tina Tucker. Good evening, Superintendent McNeil and members of the board. I have faced the start of the school year in Washoe 18 times previously. This year I had resigned myself to the fact that I was going to be teaching under the most extreme circumstances of my career. Districts across the nation and even our state chose to begin the year digitally in the interest of safety. I had hoped our decision to move ahead to face-to-face -face was based on solid plans for student and staff safety. That plans would be communicated to all stakeholders in this community and everyone would understand their role in the venture. But no, we can't even communicate our plans and decisions to the public without lying and blaming it on firefighters or hemming and hawing on a smoke day until kids are already on buses. We can't even come up with a plan on how to close down. We are skydiving while you are still deciding which parachute to pack for us. I'm sure you have your reasons for staying open, probably economic, probably political, hopefully not hubris. But just because you have reasons doesn't make them right or wise. We do not have the resources to do what you ask of us. You are trying to squeeze our blood from a stone. You say that our principals have been given the authority to fix these issues. To me, that sounds a lot like setting them up to take the blame when this ship sinks. We can't be creative when we are struggling not to drown. My goals department lead is end the year with the same teachers I began it with. I'm not sure if I can even pull that off. When the stress of trying to balance everything that's been put on my plate has not only had me come down with shingles, but I've gone to the hospital with heart problems at 42 and reasonably fit, I say this knowing full well I'm one of the lucky ones. 
To be at a year-old, one-to-one school, my challenges are minuscule compared to others in the district. My old school started the year with 13 open positions, one-third of its staff gone. One of the most naturally talented counselors I've ever met, not being able to see to the emotional needs of our students in the middle of a once-in-a-lifetime generational trauma. Because she is teaching every subject. Where is the equity? Where are the all hands on deck? For too long, we have struggled under the increasing load of a district and financial ruin. Our dedication, our blood, our sweat, and our tears have kept this ship afloat to the point that those in charge don't even realize how bad it is because they aren't the ones in the bilge being creative. Instead of raising a stink for funding, instead of showing courage and standing up for us and our students, you only try to squeeze more from us. We cannot give any more. Look elsewhere as we are spent. Your time is up, Mr. Crux. You can't function without us. Isabel Peralta, Hannah Branch, Sarah Bryant, Tina Tucker, Bob Fulkerson. Good evening. Before I start, I just want to note my name is Hannah Branch. Isabel Peralta actually was not able to stay for this portion of the meeting. Um, my name is Hannah Branch. I'm a senior in Wooster High School's International Baccalaureate Program and a member of the local student activism group, Washoe County Students for Change. Um, with respect for the overwhelming COVID response work you all, you all are engaging in, um, I want to thank you for sharing your time today. I'm here in response to the Washoe County's new policy banning teacher support of LGBT plus identities and Black Lives Matter in the classroom. After working with leadership at the school and district level on equity issues for the past few months, my group quickly learned of several impressive efforts in place, including the creation of various equity committees across the district and the promotion of culturally informed resources in classrooms. With this precedent, I was extremely surprised to hear about Washoe County's new rule, which contradicts the value you've placed on diversity and inclusion in previous conversations and policies. In the spirit of a letter which members of my group sent to you on Tuesday, July 21st of this year, we continue to request the immediate implementation of three action items in response to the national uprising against systemic racism towards people of color, the inclusion of anti-racist texts and black and indigenous people of color's perspectives at all levels of learning and in all subjects, the inclusion of events such as the Tulsa massacre and the Stonewall riots in history standards, and the release of a clear plan for how the Washoe County will work to make its faculty reflect the diversity of its student body. We are thankful for the work that the Washoe County has done so far, and for the commitment that you have shown to valuing our voices as students and activists as we work to earn your support on each of these goals. However, in response to the new policy, I must also join my peers in adding another more urgent item to that list the reversal of this anti-BLM, anti-LGBT plus policy. Going into my 12th year with the Washoe County School District, I have never once questioned whether my life matters. In the rare instances when I felt I was not safe, teachers and administrators immediately responded to my concerns and I was applauded for standing up, to myself, standing up for myself. I thank you for cultivating a system and community in which I felt cared for, celebrated, and valued through my childhood and adolescence. I'm here today to ask why the value I always felt inherent to my life as a white student cannot also be afforded to my LGBT plus peers and peers of color. In other words, what about the value of your black students and community members' lives is political where my value is assumed? I ask you to consider the reversal of this policy not just because it's the right thing to do, but because the NEA tells us that it's time we address these issues as seriously as we did during the civil rights era, because a study by the NEA found that both students of color and white students have been found to benefit academically as well as socially from ethnic studies, and because a similar Stanford study found that um, ethnic studies courses yield a 21% increase in attendance and a 1.4 point increase in grade point average. If you value diversity and student voices, our previous conversations, as our previous conversation suggests, please take action today to value black and LGBT plus lives too, starting with the removal of this ban on teacher support. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Branch.
Sarah Bryant, Tina Tucker, Bob Fulkerson, Stacy Aranda, Pablo Nava Duran. Hello, my name is Sarah Bryant and I'm the choir teacher at Sky Ranch. I would like to speak with you about the impossible burdens you have placed on teachers. First, let's look at the daily battle that is taking attendance. We're required to account for all our distance and at home students. It is not feasible using any of the platforms provided to consistently, quickly, and easily track each student. Yet teachers are expected to make contact with, in my case, hundreds of students I can't see. Every single teacher I know is struggling with the hours attendance takes each week versus the mere minutes during in-person instruction. Another example are the requirements for teaching my content. Leading up to the start of school, the board insisted singing could continue. It simply had to happen outside. First of all, without piano support, choral singing can't happen. Also, I have to take students outside in nearly 100 degree heat, have them stay masked, sing in smoky air with ambient noise such as airplanes and air conditioning units. I agree that singing inside right now is not safe due to COVID, but singing outside is impossible. So I have to write supplementary music curriculum from scratch. I was told I could use Edgenuity, but lo and behold, there is no music support for Edgenuity. After 20 years of teaching, I'm back to square one, creating curricula, trying to save my program, trying to get kids to buy into music despite the impossible burdens put on my subject. However, both of those issues pale in comparison to the insurmountable difficulty of teaching students in a hybrid, in-person, and fully distanced format. You are requiring teachers to teach five separate groups of students. In almost every class, I have to teach my A hybrid kids in front of me, provide at-home lessons for my B hybrid kids, and provide lessons for my fully distant students. However, I also have a group of students who come every single day. How do I instruct students who come every day, come half the time, and never step into a school? And then, of course, we have to provide instruction for students excluded due to COVID. I tried to use Zoom for some lessons, but of course, distance students can't always make Zooms, and the district doesn't allow recording of Zoom to be uploaded to watch later. At every turn, my instruction is being hindered. I can't sing inside or outside. I can't use the programs the school district promised we could use. I can't use the platforms that could be used to deliver content to distant students. All day long, I have students and parents emailing and messaging me asking for help I can't give because I'm actively teaching their peers. You sold parents a bill of goods. You told them we could be all things to all people and it simply isn't true. As an elective teacher, I'm used to maybe failing three to five kids a year. Right now, I have 80 students failing my classes. That's a full 30% of my learners who are failing because there is no way I can meet their educational needs. District policies prevent me at every turn from being the kind of highly effective educator I have been Ms. Bryant, for the past your time two decades. Up. Tina Tucker, Bob Fulkerson, Stacy Aranda, Pablo Nava Duran, Beth Martin. Hi, my name is Tina Tucker, and I've been uh, in this district for 25 years. I wanted to thank you all. You're making really difficult decisions. And I know you all mean well, and I know you all want what's best for our kids. But I'm here to not only ask, but beg you to listen to what we really, really need and what we really, really want. I'm in elementary school where we have every child every day when they show up. When they don't show up, we have to figure out where they are, why they're gone, what assignments they need to make up. Then we can't touch them for four days. Then we got to check them all in and we've got it. It's overwhelming. I love being back at school. It is my favorite thing in the world to be with kids, but it's not working. You promised us that no teacher was going to have to do distance learning and classroom teaching. Elementary school teachers are working 12 hours a day with only 30 minutes for lunch. That's the only break from these sweet little people that they get all day long. 
hot chili and Doritos are delivered to the classrooms that we wipe up with the giant rolls of paper towels and Dawn. You promised us distance learning cadre to handle to help us with distance learning. That hasn't happened. You, there are amazing training videos, but I have to go on my own time and teach myself how to use those training videos to be able to teach my kids. We don't have ingenuity in our elementary classrooms. All of our distance learning is what we give, and every teacher is doing it different, and every teacher is doing it by themselves, and that's not okay. Why can't we have something like North Star that has already proven that it works, that we can support, that we can help our kids with? You promised us kids were gonna get their specials classes. Well, in classes where there's more than 20, the overflow kids, who, who watches them? The computer aides, the librarians, the music teachers. Kids are not getting their specials in all schools. SLOs, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We have to pre-test those kids. We have to direct instruct, instruct those kids. Then we have to post-test those kids. How are we gonna do that when they're not there? Or when they're there two weeks and then they decide two weeks later that they don't have to be there anymore. And then they come back again in another two weeks. Can we please make that at least per quarter? I watched the video. I know how allocations work, okay? But during this time, we, we have to max out at 20 to one. If you think we can do more than that in elementary, you haven't spent a whole lot of time in our classrooms. I am begging you to help us do better because we feel like we're failing right now. And I've worked for too hard for too long to fail. And I know I'm not failing. I know I'm doing the best I can. But it's not enough and we need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tucker. Bob Fulkerson, Stacy Aranda, Pablo Nava Duran, Beth Martin, Angie Reeder. Hello, my name is Bob Fulkerson and I'm a proud product of the Washoe County School District. My teachers were exceptional. I can name you every single one that I had. They knew the trustees and the superintendent would have their backs when push comes to shove. Today, we still have exceptional teachers in the district and exceptional staff, but you trustees and superintendent no longer have the backs of the teachers. You're hell-bent on sending them into a raging pandemic without a plan to keep them safe. You ditched your reopening plan metrics at this meeting two weeks ago since adopting them would have forced you to close the schools. And at that meeting, you made oblique and gleeful references to this amorphous and then unknown Truckee Meadows Threat Meter Task Force that was then under construction by the Truckee Meadows Regional Planning and Governing Board. Well, at that governing board meeting last week to consider the risk meter, Mayor Sheevy made it clear to Trustee Simon Holland and everybody else who was there that the meter was not to be used as a tool for reopening by the district. The two principal architects of the meter, Dr. Jeremy Smith and Councilwoman Naomi Dewar, have also made that clear. I see that's on your agenda tonight. I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of rabbit you pull out of your hat. Also at that meeting, Trustee Simon Holland stated the Washoe County School District only had 18 confirmed cases out of 68,000. Two days later, there were 28 confirmed cases. There's harrowing examples of improper cleaning, poor ventilation, uh, and miscommunication between the health department and the Washoe County School District. Yet your message to parents has been, trust us, everything is fine. And you know what? The kids and the parents believe that because our teachers and our staff are doing such a darn good job. They, the kids and the parents, believe your ruse that everything is going fine. And yet, as you've seen tonight, and as I see every day, the amount of physical and mental and emotional duress suffered by the teachers and the staff is becoming unbearable, and it is not sustainable. So, I know you're gonna be data shopping tonight for more information to camouflage your lack of political courage and intellectual rigor in coming up with your own metrics. 
Um, but what I ask you is that until you do come up with a science-based transparent metrics that will keep our community safe, you close the schools for in-person instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulkerson. Stacy Aranda, Pablo Nava Duran, Beth Martin, Angie Reeder, Kristen Dehan. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having us. My name is Stacy Aranda, and I'm currently a third grade teacher at Echo Loader. Nevada has the largest class sizes in the country. Nevada is the last in funding distribution. Nevada is ranked 46th in per pupil funding distribution. Why is this normal? Why do you expect this as just the way things are? We are, are a loss of allocations, large class sizes, and underfunding all parts of a norm for you. When is enough enough? <clears throat> it's always been this way, and it seems like it's only educators who are fighting and speaking up about these issues. Right now, in third grade at Loader, my team will more than likely lose an allocation, which means we will be put on a rotation block. One teacher will probably go to first grade distance learning teaching while forcing my administration to pull a non-certified staff member to run a rotation to maintain the governor's social, social distancing orders. So a non-certified staff member will have these students for a third of their day. It is not fair to a non-certified staff to perform the duties of a certified teacher, it is insulting to teachers, and how dare we put the pressure on those guys. Kindergarten at Loader is in the same boat, and fifth grade started out the year this way. However, now we are seeing students switch from distance learning to in-person. We literally have no space or resources for these rotations at our schools. Then what are you going to do? Where are these kids supposed to go? I would like to acknowledge the hard work our, first, our 21st century department put in this summer, but it just wasn't enough. Why were teachers not trained in simply Microsoft Teams? I'm still struggling to use it, and so are my teachers. <clears throat> Where are the hot, or the hot spot buses? Loader received more hot spots than most schools, but those are designated for the full-time distance learning. So this morning, I have students who have technology from my school, but no internet service. Where is the equity? <clears throat> Why are these conditions acceptable to you? How are you okay as our educational leaders with not doing anything legislatively to fight for funding that will lead to smaller class sizes and resources for our students? But instead you say, we can do more with less. And you need to stop saying that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Rannon. Pablo Nava Duran, Beth Martin, Angie Reeder, Kristen Dehan, Catherine Larson. All right, so my name is Pauna Duan, and uh, I did some, I had some, uh, a little bit of concern with the teacher, with concern about COVID-19, about food distance learning, all kinds of stuff. So I, I did talk about the, what the, the meter weight is. And uh, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about later. So I said that the orange one, it should be, should be modified, modified uh, student, parent, faculty to be careful, make sure hybrid learning. If it's red or go on a full distance learning, if there's smoke or there's smoke outside, I know because of California, our range is uh, out of control. So we come from a uh, smoke from California, and we had to full days of learning, and I not it not make a, a difficult division, but you make a, a great uh, great effort to maybe call for a full days of learning to 
good to keep students safely. To keep students safely. And I, and I saw the poster outside to let them play. And so it's not our Watch the Sky, it's not WCSD, or Watch the Sky to School District. It's a NIAA, and then we cannot control. So uh, my solution is to let them play, but no fans, no fans allowed. And then if you got COVID, you cannot play, so. So what time? Okay, got got some time, and then I saw some uh, a video from a guy who make the a chicken tender or kind of something make a uh, jokes, kind of make a something. So here's some uh, joke of a day. Why the why did the teacher wear sunglasses? Because his class was so bright. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Navadran. That was a good joke. Beth Martin, Angie Reeder, Kristen DeHaan, Catherine Larson, Laura Murphy. Beth Martin, teacher and parent for the record. I want to begin my public comment for this meeting with a quote from Dr. McNeil's update last week, where she said that we have always worked to do more with less and provide services for our employees, students, and families. This is something we have done for years. Um, Dr. McNeil is absolutely correct, but my question is, what are we going to do to help fix this? Why do we keep accepting this as it is what it is? We must have our per pupil spending match at least the national average, reduce class sizes across all grade levels, and provide better mental health services for our students. Each cut to education further underserves our students, fails to support our families, and continues to contribute to one of the highest teacher attrition rates in the country. I have been working hard to help others in our community better understand this. I write to legislators, I participate in meetings, I reach out when I have a concern, and I welcome people into my classroom to understand how little we actually are able to do for our students with what we have been given. Each new initiative, program, test takes away from educating the whole child to meet their basic needs. We drown in paperwork, remediate students who are below grade level, challenge students who are above grade level, help students deal with trauma, are a shoulder for a student to cry on, and are there for every student to hug. Education has always been about the kids, and it will continue to always be about the kids, and they simply deserve better than we're giving them. I expect, expect more for my own children who are also part of this equation. Until we have a larger platform to fight for what our kids deserve, the state will continue cutting. This pandemic has brought to light what education has been for quite some time in Nevada, grossly underfunded and always expected to do more with less. We should use this as an opportunity to connect with our community, share the stories, share our concerns, propose solutions, and to share what we're all doing to help change things. I will continue to speak about this problem because we need to make progress together as this issue impacts all of us. The legislative session will be here soon and I will be there to support better funding for students and everyone in our community. And I hope that you can join me to fight for what we know is best. I would like to end with an all hands on deck shout out to Trustee Cottle for always being available for any question or concern that I have. He always gets back to me. And I also have to give a shout out to Paula Marca for reaching out to me, asking to spend more time in my classroom to better understand the concerns. Um, and he came without passing judgment, was very open and willing to listen. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Angie Reeder, Kristen DeHaan, Katherine Larson, 
Laura Murphy, Sarah Cheek. My name is Angie Reeder, and I would also like to start my public comment by thanking Trustee Cottle for always responding to any concerns that I have had. I feel like you take our concerns seriously and you ask the hard questions for us, so thank you. Last week, Superintendent McNeil sent us an update and she included this quote. We have always worked to do more with less and provided services for our employees, students, and families. This is something we have done for years. Let that sink in. Something we have done for years. This is exactly what teachers have been expressing for years. Teachers from the Empower Nevada Teachers Group have been standing before you for the past year begging you to hear us and fight for better fundings with us. Nevada is currently funded $3,000 below the national average. If we were adequately funded, many of the issues you have been hearing about, such as lack of technology for distance learning, overflowing classrooms, and the possibility of losing allocations over one or two students would be non-existent. Many teachers have been doing their part to bring about change. We are attending board meetings, sharing our concerns with all of you. We are writing our legislators, stressing to them that the funding formula needs to be changed. We attend rallies and try to bring about community awareness surrounding the struggles of our education system. So my question is, what are you all going to do to help? Are you going to write letters to legislators? Are you sharing honestly with the community how drastically underfunded we are and that you are also tired of doing more with less? I know we are all on the same team here. We all want what's best for our 64,000 students. I implore you to stand with all of your teachers across the state of Nevada in Carson City in February and demand our state fund education adequately. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reeder. Kristen DeHaan, Katherine Larson, Laura Murphy, Sarah Cheek, Anna Inuake. My name is Elizabeth Cadigan for the record. I'm here to read um, on behalf of Amy Bentel, a teacher in Sparks. President Raymond, Board of Trustees and Superintendent McNeil, Tomorrow, my entire class and I can finally return to our classroom after being excluded on August 26 for 14 days. Not only were we excluded, but four other staff members were as well. In addition, an intermediate teacher who had to stay home with her child who is in my class, adding to the shortage of staff. This case disrupted 24 households and could have completely been avoided. Despite your trust in the public, there are many families who are not screening their children before school, nor are they keeping their children home while awaiting results from a COVID test. The shortage of staff at my school has caused a logistical burden. Teachers have been unable to eat lunch, take breaks, or even meet to lesson plan. This has nothing to do with our amazing administrators. Everybody is working so hard, but there are so no money for additional staff, no substitutes available, and the all hands on deck repeatedly promised by the district is false. There needs to be clear communication and common protocol district wide about exclusion. Margaret Allen told many watching the district's Q&A forum on August 12th that at the elementary school level, we will exclude the whole class, including the teacher for 14 days. If this is true, then why is my class the only full class that has been excluded? It is, is it because we had only been in school for two days and we were following Ms. Allen's protocol at that point? The decision to exclude my students and five staff members for the full 14 days was made by the health department in 30 minutes. Following our date of exclusion, cases at the elementary level have had 24 hours to evaluate the situation. Has the procedure been changed due to the massive shortage of teachers and substitutes who are unwilling to put their lives on the line because they aren't paid enough and therefore makes it more difficult to run a school effectively and safely? There is also a major communication problem between the health department and school district. The health department didn't contact me or my family students until five days following our exclusion. 
This is completely understandable because on their July 28th presentation, Kevin Dick and Heather Kerwin told you that there would be a delay in notification due to the amount of cases and the lack of contract tracers available. I am of the mindset that when there is a problem, solutions should be shared. Unfortunately, I have no solutions today because all the letters and comments staff and community members have sent you the past few months have been disappointingly fallen upon deaf ears. Thank you. I forgot who. Catherine Larson, Laura Murphy, Sarah Cheek, Anna Inuke, Chantal Abonia. Good afternoon. My name is Katherine Larson. I am a first grade teacher, and this is my second year with the district. I'm going to tell you now that first year was not quite what I expected. The second year continues in that pattern. Now, I'm going to tell you, when hearing the classic five-year career of new teachers, I want to tell you it is never the children as to why I and my peers below five and perhaps those who have been in the district far longer consider quitting. In fact, those students are the only reason why I still come to work. The <laughs> sheer lack of funding, which is confusing considering the data for SBAC, costs about $9 million, and SLO data is entirely unnecessary right now, so I'm asking you to prioritize. The pathetic planning and comical expectations on a district level, the belief that teachers must take home work beyond our contract hours because that's how it's always been, horrible pay because although new in this career is a dedicated, educated professional and just educating and loving our future generations, I should be bringing home more than $2,900 a month. While studying at UNR, I attended multiple NEA conferences due to my presidential positions in education, and once asked an established Nevada teacher if she had any suggestions for me as I approached working in the state. She told me to find another career. I wrote it off as she was worn out, but I get it now. This state is not normal. Hearing that senior talk about how nice it is to not have as many kids in her class, that's simply having smaller class sizes. That is a wonderful way to benefit education. I adore my students, as we all do, and I'm here to make them feel safe, loved, and heard, all while teaching. If you need help, board, we are here to support you, but you need to have teachers and staff, ESPs, all of us on mind, when you're making decisions. Not the money that will hopefully come at the end of the month if you stay long enough, and certainly more than the soap and water you provided us as protection. I'm really hoping that some of those Lysol wipes around this room can actually come to our schools. If you decide to transition to distance learning entirely, we need to be prepared as a district to support families that don't have technology, who don't have access to Wi-Fi, the iPhone that's shared between six family members, and just general childcare during their work hours. Whatever your six-figure salaries are, I assure you are not as important as Nevada's children. Poor management is an art form in Nevada. Education has not been a priority. That time for change is now. Now. This is us representing change. Help us, please. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Laura Murphy, Sarah Cheek, Anna Inuke, Chantal Ebonia, Vanessa Medina, Gabby Garcia. Good afternoon, board members and Dr. McNeil. Uh, for the record, my name is Laura Murphy. I'm an elementary school teacher and I teach in, in person. Um, I'm here representing my profession, my colleagues, and my school tonight. I feel, felt compelled to speak with you this evening about concerns I have with the way funding and allocations will happen this school year. Schooling during COVID has been anything but ordinary or traditional. 
We as a district, therefore, need to look at how we can fund schools so that teachers stay in already established classrooms. We've worked so hard to build relationships with students to this point, and it, I feel very sad about uh, major movement of students and teachers. Um, we also need to receive the level of support given during the first weeks of school this year. The all hands on deck approach needs to continue with the funding and prioritizing of classroom teachers. The final numbers for allocations at my school are not yet in, but in every scenario we have considered, it will lead to a devastating number of teachers being lost. This will cause a domino effect of chaos, including classrooms being collapsed and overstuffed with kids, a lack of staff in the school to safely distance students, a lack of appropriate staffing to help with sanitizing and disinfecting high surface areas, and the eventual need to establish overflow rooms staffed with non-credentialed teachers as students move back and forth between distance and in-person learning. We must prioritize humans in the classroom during this pandemic. Teachers must be able to safely distance students and attend to the emotional needs of kids during these difficult times. I understand our district is underfunded and I have some suggestions. I encourage the board to look at paid platforms for compliance for a possible source of additional funding for classroom teachers such as my PGS, SLO requirements, SBAC, DRC, MAP testing, and school city platforms. When we are operating under a pandemic, the value of these platforms must be re-evaluated. Millions of dollars will be spent collecting data that will likely not be as reliable as under normal operating conditions. We should funnel this money directly to classrooms and teachers to keep kids safely distanced, to keep classrooms properly maintained and sanitized, to keep all students with a credentialed teacher during their school day, and to help the stress of ancillary workload demands on teachers to a minimum so that we can focus more intensely on our students and their emotional needs. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Murphy. Sarah Cheek, Anna Inuke, Chantal Abania, Vanessa Medina, Gabby Garcia. My name is Sarah Cheek and I am a CLS teacher at a middle school. I think at this point, it's evident that we are in a state of crisis management and damage control. The repercussions of poor planning and a failure to listen to your employees has created untenable situations for our schools, teachers, students, and families. I'm here today because I want our families to know that teachers are fighting their very hardest to provide the best education for their students. But the sad fact is we are, we are dreadfully underfunded and our children are paying the price. How can this district expect quality employees to stay when they aren't paid a livable wage? Our substitutes and paraprofessionals are being given the same responsibilities as licensed teachers, yet only being paid as low as $13 an hour, and many with no benefits. How can you expect them to stay in this profession? How can you in good conscience continue to overburden teachers? Today I'm speaking up for special education teachers and all teachers. We are at a breaking point. As the paperwork piles up every day, teachers have to look at our piles and decide if we're going to self-sacrifice our health, families, and sanity for a thankless career. And now to add on to our already impossible workload, we have five day a week in person, hybrid, and distance learners to contend with. We are working through our lunches, working well before and after our contract times. How can you continue to claim a do no harm policy when you know that more and more students are not having their educational and emotional needs met because teachers and counselors are being spread too thin? How large do class sizes have to get before we acknowledge the harm being done to our students? How many teachers have to tell you that it wrong before you acknowledge the situation and join them for a solution. We know that many issues exist because there is not enough funding. We need you to stop blaming your staff and join them. We need you to fight with us for more funding. 
We need a can-do attitude you demand from your employees, from you to fight with us. Ultimately, we are on the same team. All you have to do is listen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cheek. Anna Inuke, Chantal Ebania, Vanessa Medina, Gabby Garcia, Janet Roman, Lisa Cohen, Deanna Mandacek. Good evening, Washoe County School members. My name is Ana Nukai, and I'm a sophomore at Damani. Uh, my name is Gabby Garcia, and I'm a junior at Reed High School. My name is Chantal Bonia, and I'm a sophomore at Wooster High School. And I'm Vanessa Medina, a junior at Reed High School. We, the students of Washoe County School District, come to you today to voice our concerns regarding recent events of hate and anti-blackness in our country. This, along with the importance of combating racism through the implementation of diverse anti-racist textbooks and curriculum in our schools, is why we stand before you here today. Not only due to the recent events in which there have been multiple instances of racism against black communities, but also due to the institutionalized racism set against all minorities in our country since its beginning. We wanted to bring attention to the problem of anti-blackness in America, specifically how we can fight to be anti-racist and encourage a productive dialogue on race and identity among our student bodies. We are leaders of an organization called Diversify Our Narrative. Our main goal is to integrate the use of anti-racist and diverse texts in English and literature classes. We hope that this accomplishes a more diverse and rich education for students of all backgrounds. We aim to do this by advocating for a mandate that a minimum of at least one book in every English lit and comprehension class be by a person of color and about a person of color's experiences. We also ask that teachers have the autonomy to choose books from the recommended list provided or that the chosen text accurately portrays those in said communities. We are not asking for these decisions to be implemented immediately. We only ask that you give it deep consideration while we gather support. We are aware of and appreciate the district's already implemented effort to acknowledge racism and its issues. We are all have read To Kill a Mockingbird in class and thoroughly enjoyed it. However, we do not believe the current curriculum is inclusive to the great variety of races and backgrounds in our community nor that the experiences we read about are directly from the victim's mouths. We are currently working with librarians and teachers as we believe that they are the backbone of this desired change. We look forward to working with you to change this and strongly believe that the inclusion of students in this will greatly benefit everyone. We are prepared to work closely alongside you and we thank you for your time. We also open to suggestions to how to move forward in implementing our goals successfully. Diversify Our Narrative's mission and leaders can be found at their website, diversifyournarrative.com. The names of the student, alumni, school faculty, par and parents slash guardians in agreement with our proposal can be found in your emails within 24 hours. Again, we appreciate your time. Thank you for the work you have done, and we look forward to presenting to you again in due time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I know Dr. McNeil wanted to just mention something. Hey, Gabby, will you do me a favor? I'm going to have you speak with our um, Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Troy Parks, because what I'd like him to be able to do is we have an Equity and Diversity Task Force meeting this Thursday on the 10th, and I'd like for you all to be able to participate. So he's going to get your contact information so you all can participate. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Janet Roman. Lisa Cohen, Deanna Mandacek, Malia Pukta, Jack Heineman. I am a teacher at Sparks High and a former Sparks High student. Welcome to our hood. Welcome to 89431. You are sitting in a gym that finally has ventilation after a six-year process, in a school that has struggled and still struggles with ventilation issues. You are sitting in the gym of a school that resides in the area code with the highest active COVID cases in our county, the area code with one of the largest Latino populations and one of the highest numbers of students who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, students who show up, echando le ganas, 
giving it their all. I am grateful to work alongside caring teachers, staff, and administrators who also give their all and do their best despite the little tools and guidance that we have been given. Enough is enough. We are doing what we can with what little we have, but I am tired tired of being lied to by our district and tired of not being heard. I am tired of sleepless nights. I am tired of being overworked. There is no more time for patience and grace when harm is being done and has been done to every member of our community. The last few weeks have proved what we already knew, what you chose not to listen to. We have spoken up, written, protested, but you have not listened, not budging one inch despite blunder after blunder, choosing only to showcase certain narratives. You have chosen to not take responsibility for a lack of planning and the COVID outbreaks already occurring at several school sites. I am tired of being told that we have safe conditions in our schools when that is far from the truth. How can we be safe without proper ventilation? How can we be safe without adequate cleaning time and supplies? The truth is that the injustices that schools like ours faced before the pandemic are now more exasperated than ever. The truth is that try as we might, our low-income students and our students of color are at the highest risk of illness and systemic inequity. The truth is that every day that I walk into the building, I worry that this might be the day that I, or one of my students, or one of their family members contracts COVID. As of today, I have more students excluded from the classroom than I am averaging in the classroom. Our students are actively being harmed by you, by your policies and by your choice to open schools in the name of our economy. Not in the name of our students, not in the name of equity. It is not equitable to put our most vulnerable students and staff in harm's way. And we know that we cannot SEL and mindfulness our way out of systemic inequities and oppression. We need more funding, we need more resources, we need smaller classroom sizes and caseloads, not just, but especially in the middle of a pandemic that disproportionately affects communities like ours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roman. Lisa Cohen, Deanna Mandacek, Malia Pukta, Jack Heineman, John Patterson. Hello, my name is Lisa Cohen and I teach at Sepulveda Elementary School. Last year I taught first grade and when Bow Hatch opened, the projection for the number of students attending Sepulveda dropped. Among others, we lost a first grade allocation. I was at risk of being overaged, but I was thankfully able to change grade levels. I'm currently teaching second and I'm one of the two distance teachers for the grade level. However, now with many parents concerned about COVID-19, the numbers of Sepulveda are lower than ever. I was informed two weeks ago by my principal that I was at risk for being overaged again. There are no grade levels for me to switch to this time as my school is not projected to receive any new allocations. Overaging my position will affect a lot more than just where I drive to work every, day, every morning. Removing any teacher from their classroom after the year has already begun isn't just unfortunate, it's wrong. But as a distance teacher, I will argue that it's even worse. My schedule and routines affect parents as well as students. I have created an environment where seven and eight year olds are engaged in learning through a screen. I've created a connection with parents who feel appreciative of the lengths I'm going through to make this difficult situation successful. I know this to be true because many parents have provided me feedback saying so. I retaught a lesson that some students missed due to GT testing and I want to share a message from one family regarding this. Thank you so much for doing the extra lesson with A. She is really loving your class and we have been so impressed with how well run and organized it is. It has alleviated so many of the concerns we had when we made the decision to do the distance learning. Thank you. While this comment is not only validating, it's also heartbreaking because I've known for two weeks now that I may be removed as her teacher. Do you know how hard it is to effectively lie to students and their parents? Because that's what I've been doing. I've also been planning around the fact that a new teacher may be taking over for me, which sometimes means making decisions I wouldn't otherwise. I began this school year with one thing in mind, to limit change as much as possible. So much so that when I asked my students and their families to be patient with me while I figured out how distance learning will work, I specifically told them I wanted to limit the amount of changes. I knew there would be a lot and I wanted to control as much of it as I could, but this I can't control. We were asked at the beginning of this year to be flexible and I promise when it comes to teaching, no one is more flexible than me. Now I'm asking you to be flexible with us, the staff that service our children every day. 
The district has stated that mental health is a top priority, so I'm asking the board to please consider using the CARES Act funding to let all teachers remain in their current places and hire new teachers for any open positions so as not to disrupt the delicate balance we have worked so hard in the last few weeks to create. I don't want to be seen as just an expense on a budget report. I am more than that to my school, to my students, to my community. Um, I created a petition with three days ago and it's been signed by over 1,000 people in our community. While the topic of class sizes and the practice of teacher overages will need to be addressed again in the future, we are asking you to do the right thing now for the mental health of our students, families, and district staff by suspending the overage process for this school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Deanna Mandachek, Malia Pukta, Jack Heineman, John Patterson, Ashley Wade. Hello, I'm Deanna Mandachek, a parent. Thank you for the response. I also sent an email, but seeing how mental health is becoming such a big issue, I know you guys have a lot of issues you're dealing with tonight and a lot of the teachers, but being a parent, we are definitely, it's our job to take care of our children and their mental health. So I'm gonna second all the comments about that, looking out for the mental health of the kids. Um, this plan to keep them safe, too, with the virus this year. I know we're dealing with a lot of different issues, but it's not keeping them safe from the mental illness. We've all seen the statistics. Um, I won't go into that, and I know that's not your job, but we know that the health effects of the kids on these lockdowns and everything they're keeping from participating in activities has been worse than the actual virus. We need to keep them as our priority. It's our job as parents and your job as administrators to fight for our kids. We're asking for your help to help us fight. We're not just gonna look at the policies, we're gonna fight for them. Even Fauci said it's better to be outside. By taking away their infrastructure, like the regular school and their routine and their sports, extracurricular activities, we're taking away their safety and the support structure. We aren't just talking about the athletes and the extracurricular activities, but the student body. For example, those kids, hundreds of kids, thousands just in our own districts, Friday nights that go to football games, I wonder what they're doing Friday nights now. Um, I just wanted to say that we've all been watching the events and the drama of the year, so thank you for everything you are doing, but we can't just not, we can't say no to our kids. We know the statistics and we're responsible for their safety. There are many states opening up across the country. They're watching other kids playing sports. It's devastating to them. The high schools are playing. Our kids are watching. There's, they don't understand. They're depressed, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're confused. We need to be there and support them. We need to do more than that. We need to fight for them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mandichuk. Malia Pukta, Jack Heineman, John Patterson, Ashley Wade, Mia Albright. Good evening, it's been a while. Um, Malia Pukta for the record. Um, the, these first few weeks of school have been difficult. I think that that's an understatement. They've been frustrating for me and for my three kids. The girls are super excited to be back at school. They finally get to get out of the house. They, they get to see their friends, the few of them that are actually in school with them. Um, and, and I don't mean that it's been frustrating or difficult in that the first week of school, more than half of the week was canceled because of the smoke or that we got that 645 call on Friday that there wasn't going to be no school, that it was going to be full distance, which was fine for my, my two older kids because they were scheduled to be home anyway. My elementary student, her teachers didn't know what to do. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have any time to come up with a plan. So you know what she got assigned? Reading for an hour, 
which is something I would have made her do anyway, write a summary, practice your math facts. It, that's not learning. We were promised that if there were distance learning, the kids would actually be learning. My older kids, when they're doing their distance work, they're repeating stuff that they learned at the last class that they were in person to. They're not getting anything new. And the teachers, they are doing their absolute best. I can't imagine being in their shoes. You have doubled their workload. They have, you've heard this from teachers. I'm a parent. I'm not the one that has to do this. I saw this on my own. I haven't talked to any teachers because I'm not allowed in the school building. You're asking them to create curriculum and lesson plans for kids that are going to be in school today, which they could probably recycle and reuse for the kids that are in school tomorrow. But then they also have to create lessons for the kids who are in school today but are at home tomorrow and the kids that are at home today but are in school tomorrow, and then there's the ones that don't come to school at all. I mean, my head is spinning, not even, not even having to be the one to do that. And you're asking these kids to use all these different apps nobody's trained them to use. The apps are not working. My ninth grader has had four classes where she gets zeros or assignments marked late because she clicked the submit button but it didn't go through because her and her sister are both home working on the internet at the same time while I am working my job on the internet. So somebody dropped the ball. Everything that we've been promised, nothing has been delivered. Ms. Pukta, I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you. Jack Heineman, John Patterson, Ashley Wade, Mia Albright, MJ Abando. Good afternoon, members of the board, Superintendent McNeil, President Raymond, Vice President Taylor. My name is Jack Heineman, and I'm a proud recent graduate, home of the Mustangs, Damani Ranch High School. I came here today to talk about the future. This pandemic has wrecked havoc on education as we know it all around our nation. Whether it's the digital divide in our community, some students being pulled into homeschooling, or even just the pure challenge of distance learning, gaps of knowledge will and do exist. We have to recognize that some students are going to fall behind. Our educators, they're suffering. They're working their hardest. In fact, they're moving mountains to provide a quality education for their students, for our students. Some call this creativity. I call this drowning. I encourage the board to openly have discussions about these gaps with our community and our educators. We simply can't leave these impossible tasks to our teachers to solve alone. I fear that when all hands aren't on deck, when things start getting back to normal, we'll brush aside the students who've fallen behind. I know you have a full plate with many, many more decisions to make, but my hope is that we don't lose sight of the imminent challenges coming our way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heineman. John Patterson, Ashley Wade, Mia Albright, MJ Ubondo, Parker Luthi. Good evening for the record. My name is Ashley Wade. I speak, I'm a teacher in Sun Valley, but I speak to you today as a parent raising my family's fourth generation of Washoe County School District students. As a matter of fact, my grandmother, my, my mother, my aunts and uncles on both sides, uh, my great aunts and uncles, my cousins, my siblings, and I all attended Sparks High School. Uh, my uh, sister's child attended Sparks High School a few years ago, and we have more coming on the way. 
Um, and in this room where there are 20 staff members working as presented like this is what actually happens, this kind of safety is where um, really we ha I was in this room with 1,800 kids for assemblies and those kinds of things. Um, that is not how it looks in our classrooms at all. Still this number of people, but at Alice Maxwell where I went, that is, this is like a facade. Anyway, I'm trying to raise good men. Men who seek enthusiastic consent, who do not abuse their power at work or their partner, nor stalk the mother of their children. I'm trying to raise men who do not look forward to working with abusers. <sighs> who are instead honest, caring, considerate, and who do not cause harm. And you make my job very difficult these last few weeks. Because those are my values and what I'm trying to do, I talk with my children every year about our country's history and how we treat each other as workers because I tell them their job is to go to school and be a worker and one day you'll be an adult who does as well. A very brief lesson for you, 140 years ago, companies were invested in keeping employees in unsafe buildings six days a week for very little pay. They killed people in that pursuit. Shortly thereafter, the US textile industry was invested in keeping employees, specifically women and children, in unsafe buildings and under the watchful eye of enforcers to make sure they're working hard enough. Those women and children were harmed regularly until 1911 when 145 workers were killed in the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. None of that was sustainable and it was bound to change because the work does not happen without the workers. I thank the Madam's President and Vice President for taking some action this month to bring a mod modicum of integrity to this board. Still, as you heard in a very sad story two weeks ago, the building is on fire. You're in my house right now, and it is on fire. Yet you force build people in this building, and you have barred the doors. The hours are long and grueling, well beyond what is safe, well beyond what is contractually obligated in our labor agreements. The pay is very little, and you have barred the doors. I struggle to find anything in this new way of schooling that helps me raise good men. And I would suggest to you, you re remember the value of the people that you're dealing with. Thank you, Miss Wade. Mia Albright. MJ Ubondo, Parker Luthi, Kiana Bunting, Weston Smith. Hello, my name is Mia Albright. I'm a former Reno High student currently attending North Star Online Academy and a member of the student-led group Washoe County Students for Change. My team member Hannah Branch spoke earlier. I'm here today to ask for the district's reversal of the decision to prohibit teacher support of Black Lives Matter in schools. To preface this, I would like to define anti-racism as well as contextualize the movement in question. Anti-racist education is a theory of learning and action to help us do the important work of dismantling racism in schools. It explicitly highlights critiques and challenges in institutional racism. It addresses how racist beliefs and ideologies structure one-on-one -on -one interactions and personal relationships. This is from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Black Lives Matter was founded in response to the wrongful absolution of George Zimmerman, the man who shot and killed Trayvon Martin. Trayvon was only 17 when he died. His death sparked nationwide protests and led to the creation of the movement as a whole in 2013. The simple fact of the matter is that Black Lives Matter is not political and should not be politicized. This is because it's a matter of human rights, not politics. While I understand that there is legal precedent in defense of this targeted policy, there is no pragmatic reason for it to be made. The district said in a statement that it is seeking to accommodate all perspectives in the classroom with this decision, but I must ask, one with the perspective that black lives do not matter warrant accommodation under Washoe County School District policy. Already, school districts in the US are taking major action to be actively anti-racist. In fact, school board members in the Albemarle County School District in Virginia 
passed an anti-racism program in 2019. They're very clear in that they, dis they strive to be anti-racist, stating they reject all forms of racism as destructive to their mission, vision, values, and goals. In the span of just one year, this policy has taught these students new information. They were shocked upon learning that Thomas Jefferson, who is often idolized in history classrooms, was a slave owner. Evidently, there are some gaps in our curriculum, which resources like Project Tahoe and Teaching Tolerance are available in Washoe County to use and are helping to close. However, not allowing teachers to address Black Lives Matter in the classroom stops this progress and will be detrimental to school functioning as a safe place for its students. I implore you to reverse this decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Albright. MJ Ubondo, Parker Luthi, Kayana Bunting, Weston Smith, Cade Rodehafer. My name is MJ Ubondo, a teacher here at Sparks High, and I wasn't planning on speaking today because board meetings have become a maddening case of dangerous deja vu. These past few months have turned me into a cynic, and I fully expect that nothing I or anything anyone else will say here today will compel you to act any differently, despite all the speeches that have come before me. Although I am speaking to you, I am speaking for everyone but you. I am speaking today because you are in my neighborhood, a neighborhood which has one of the highest reported cases of COVID in the county. You are at my school, a school where in the past five years I have met some amazing educators who will continue to run themselves ragged for our students in spite of the impossible circumstances you have placed us in. A school with administrators who, even if they may not agree, support my right to speak and recognize that it comes from nothing but deep care and concern for the school and this profession which I love. I am speaking today because I, my school, my community, and my students deserve better and more than anything deserve truth. As I speak, I know of positive COVID cases in several schools that have yet to be announced to the public. I know of air conditioning systems that have not worked for years and are still not fixed. I know of distance learning teachers with rosters of 100 students or more who are grading AP chemistry labs even though they haven't taken chemistry since college. As I speak, I know of several classes throughout the district that are far over social distancing capacity who have been thrown new students because no one thought of a plan of where to put them. I know so many teachers who are scared and concerned, some who have symptoms but were told to go back to school because despite more false promises, there are no subs to cover them. As I speak, I know that in almost all of these incidents, teachers have been told to keep quiet, to let it go, to not say anything because it will only hurt other teachers. I am here speaking have and will leave. Regardless of your propaganda, we are not okay and teachers are discouraged and drowning. I'm speaking for students who only feel protected because their teachers are protecting them from the madness you've created, who do not yet fully understand the way you are gambling with their lives and education. This year was going to be difficult no matter what, but because of poor planning and a blatant disregard of fact and reason, this year already feels insurmountable. You robbed us of the chance to do this right, to do this together. I am not speaking to you today, but to those of you who remain after the election in the hopes that you care more about lives and education then than you do about public image now. More importantly, I am speaking to the people who I hope will replace you, to the future board members and superintendents who are in this room or watching from another one. I hope to mind them that, this is, that true transparency is not just celebrating progress, but admitting mistakes and doing the work to repair the harm that mistakes have made. I hope to remind them that true leadership is listening to the people you lead. I'm speaking to all the teachers who feel defeated to remind them and myself that only one thing has ever been true. If we want something done, we have to do it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ubando. Parker Luthi, Kiana Bunting, Weston Smith, Cade Rodehafer, Justin Harley. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Parker Luthi. I'm a student athlete at Spanish Springs High School. I'm also a senior. I'm here today to uh, encourage you and encourage you and to um, 
just encourage you to allow football in the fall for many reasons. One of these reasons, this summer, during our summer weights program, the Spanish Springs High School varsity football team, along with the Damani and Reed football teams, all practiced and none of us came down with any COVID. It was all COVID free. Also, there are 35 states in the country that are they're currently playing every Friday night while student athletes in Nevada, California, Oregon, and many other states are being robbed of their childhood dream of having a senior year for football and just having a football season. And for many of us seniors, college football and just football in general is how we are going to make it and pay for college. And without a football season in the fall, just the six games that you guys are proposing in the spring, it, won't be, it just simply won't be enough for those colleges. For those colleges to actually show interest in us, we need to have a lot of really good game film, and a lot of it. And this, I've been talking to colleges this whole summer, and all these colleges have said that it's most likely that I'll get an offer if we have a season, and if I show them all these new game film. But if I don't have a season, if we don't have a season, we're robbed of that. And so I'm here asking you to help us athletes to get us to college. It helps us. All we need is you guys to back us up. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luthi. Bunting, Weston Smith, Cade Rodehafer, Justin Harley, Elijah Tau Tolliver. Hello. My name is Kiana Bunting. I've actually spoken in front of you before, so it's great how this gets easier with time. Um, so I want to start with that um, my mother is tired of hearing me call her and crying with um, the mess of the abusive relationship that I feel that I'm in, but I tell her that I'm in it because of the kids. Um, but I'm sure, as you've been hearing today from uh, the mass amount of teachers and the students who have bravely come out to speak to you today, that we are furious about the actions that have been made in regards to these said teachers and students. So let me first speak on distance learning, or well, lack of that, because I was told personally two days prior to school starting that I was moving from being an original classroom in person where I had notified all of my parents that I was excited to have them in my class to being told, oh, never mind, just kidding. I'm just being moved to distance learning, and now I have to change the two weeks that you had kindly given us to prepare to now unprepare and re-prepare myself for something that I want but was not ready for. Um, my students that were given hotspots were given hotspots that only had 20 gigabytes, I'm hoping a month, and that is not enough data for four weeks of online streaming of the effective education that I'd love to give these kids. Um, in your email today, Dr. McNeil, I saw that you, um, we received those hotspot buses and immediately got excited and went straight to that website to see what I can do for my, st my students to give them these opportunities, only to be instantly disappointed to know that the closest hotspot to the students in my neighborhood is 1.7 miles away. While that might not seem a lot, crossing two major streets as a child under the age of 10 is unsafe and unrealistic. So I guess I'm stuck with the six kids who have these hotspots and or poor internet to not be able to do distance learning the way that they should be because Teams is constantly kicking them out and having to restart them in. And so I'm spending more time doing technical issues with our internet connection that I actually am teaching quality instruction. As I um, know that this is the best, the safest option, but somehow now isn't the best option because we didn't allow ourselves the time to be ready. Also, another thing that I have heard several times now is how was there no cap on distance learning kids? 
one teacher to 60 to 100 kids on Zoom is not equitable, and there's no way that that teacher can possibly be reaching these students. <sighs> Allocations. <laughs> Man, I'm, you guys have really dropped the ball on this one, and I understand that that might not be something that is directly able for you to do, but there needs to be more that needs to be done. I can't possibly speak on um, Bunting, more on what has already been said. Ms. Bunting, I'm oh. sorry, your time is up. Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Bunting, I'm going to have you speak with, um, is Chris Turner here? There he is. Would you raise your hand, Chris? I'm going to have you um, talk to Chris Turner about our Wi-Fi buses and see if we are able to, but he's going to need to know your school. All right. Thank you. Weston Smith, Cade Rodehaffer, Justin Harley, Elijah Tolliver, Valerie Wade. Hello, my name is Weston Smith and I'm a sophomore at Damani Ranch High School and also a football player. I'm here to ask the school, school board to consider bringing back fall sports and especially football during this semester. Starting, I have multiple reasons for asking this and I'm going to start with the numbers. I'm sure you guys all know the stat of in 2018, 900, from January through August, 946,000 people died from all causes. And this year, from January through August, 944,000 people have died. The decrease probably comes from more people quarantining and staying safe. But I'm just pointing out that there is an extremely low death rate for the COVID-19. Also, um, the school this year, I feel has a different, when I go to school every other day, I feel a different energy than I did last year. Last year there was excitement, there was happiness, people were wanting to go to school, and everyone had something to look forward to. What for me it was Friday nights under the lights for football, and for other people it was being able to do the marching band or for cheerleaders cheering everybody on. But now when I go to school, I feel as if everyone's not as social, there's not as much energy around the school, and everyone, they're just there to be able to go instead of wanting to be there and really enjoying their time. And also reiterating what Parker Luthi said, there was zero cases or any infractions of a sickness when we had our three weeks of summer practice before we were unfortunately shut down due to COVID-related causes. And my last point is, I'm just asking you guys to please help the high school athletes or just high schoolers that are also in extracurricular activities to be able to fight for their season and to just help their success. Finally, I just want to state there's been 35 high schools playing football with the cases continuing to go down. There's the energy of the high school itself is down, I'm guessing amongst all the county and I just would like to understand what is stopping us from playing football this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Cade Rodehaffer, Justin Harley, Elijah Tau Tolliver, Valerie Wade, Maria Casado. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Cade Rodehofer. I am a junior student athlete at Damani Ranch. Uh, I am here advocating to bring back fall sports as early as October. Uh, the reason I am uh, proposing this is because we've had a thousand games across the United States of call, uh, high school football, zero community spread of COVID because of those games. In total in the United States, we have 170,566 deaths from COVID-19 as of September 2nd. In the age groups, 15 to 24, uh, we've had about 300 deaths. Out of those deaths, kids who would be playing high school sports have a 0.00019% chance of dying. 
that a one point or one percent of dying from COVID-19 from playing high school sports. Narrow that down to males for football, it would still be a 1% chance of dying from COVID-19. Why we're not playing is beyond me. I feel like I would probably have a better chance of dying in a car crash than playing high school football. In Washoe County, we have had 7,371 cases and 140 deaths. That's a 2% death rate just in Washoe County. In Tennessee, as of September 1st, they had 120,000 cases with about 3,000 deaths. Nevada, that, you know, you know, it's really hurt is just seeing everyone else getting the opportunity that we don't. And we're such a smaller place than all these other spots. And why can't we play? So I hope you guys take the time to look at the numbers and see that young high school athletes have, you know, 99.9% .9 chance of surviving from playing uh, high school football. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodeker. Justin Harley, Elijah Tal Tolliver, Valerie Wade, Maria Casado. I think uh, Vice President Taylor would just like to address something related to athletics. Gentlemen, if you'd like to wait just a second in the back. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, as a member of the NIA Governing Board, I just wanted to clarify that it is not a, a vote of the school board or vote of the Washoe County School District that has changed the schedule for the sports in the fall. That was a decision that was made by the, uh, in, in, the NIAA uh, Legislative Committee in, in support of um, the governor's directives and that committee uh, had uh, conversations with all the league presidents across the state, um, the superintendents association as well, but the, the NIA schedule is in the control of the NIAA, not in control of any particular school board or any particular school district. And um, additionally, some of the districts um, within the NIAA um, are, are not having in-person instruction, which my understanding would prohibit them from having in-person athletics competitions. So it's more, much more of a complicated issue, but the important thing for you as you advocate um, is to know that it's, um, it's not something that any individual board did, but that the, 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 um, the Legislative Committee of the NIA, again, in consult consultation with the governor, will include the fact that some districts are not having in-person instruction and could not therefore have in-person athletics competition. So hopefully that clarifies that a little bit more for you um, to let you know kind of what the status is. I know you have a desire to play, and I certainly understand that, but I wanted to provide that information for you since you took the time to come out tonight. Valerie Wade, Maria Casado. Uh, my name is Valerie Wade. I always come with prepared remarks and then I listen to other people and I scratch them all out so I might sound a little disjointed now. Uh, I'm not here as a teacher. I'm here as a grandmother, as a citizen of 89431, which as they've said, has the highest active cases number in the community, 158 active cases that we know of right now. I'm here as a railroader because we bleed maroon and gold in our house. I want to say, first of all, please do not use this new threat meter designed in secret to address an economic emergency to determine what is safe for staff and students. You have a recommendation from our health district that has all the data and latest science on the pandemic. Please listen to the health district when it comes to public health. There is no one else more qualified. 
And I would add that today, our 14-day number of deaths, COVID deaths in Washoe County is at 14. So over the last 14 days, 14 people in this community have died from COVID. So we can assume tomorrow someone's gonna die and the next day is gonna someone's gonna die. And that's if we're lucky. That's if this experiment doesn't go completely wrong and we create some type of super spread in this community. Second, I wanna address the dozens of real life horror stories I've heard and read from Washoe County teachers and administrators and now I've just heard dozens more. What you're doing has been an absolute disaster. If anyone is telling you it's working and that schools and students are safe, they are lying. That is not what is being said in the community. I have a, I don't know how it happened, but many, many, many of my peers who grew up here encouraged their children to become teachers here also. That was a mistake. Now we have adult children who are in a career that they have got to get out of if they're gonna save their lives. Our education system is being gutted. Families are leaving the system to homeschool or to attend private schools. And it is a concern that I have that at the end of all of this, we will have an even more economically and racially segregated education system than we do now. Last, I would say to teachers, all of the teachers that were here, the one who said her mother is advising her she's in an abusive relationship with her employer. Stop, just stop. Stop working more for less. No matter how passionate you are about your work, what you do is not who you are. An educator is- Good evening, for the record, my name is Maria Rene Castello and I'm coming to you as a teacher here in Sparks. I am a graduate and product of this district and I was honored to come back and work here. I love it here, it's my home. I'm here to talk to you about class size. Last year, I had 27 students in a classroom that was 102 square feet. I had four to five students to a table, and let me tell you, we were crammed in there. This year, I have 24 students on my roster with 18 of them being in person. Just in the last week, I've had two students go from distance to in person. I literally don't have room for another student to physically join my classroom and meet the distancing requirements unless I get rid of resources like my already limited classroom library. I am calling on you to be flexible, just like all teachers have been, with allocations. We are currently in a pandemic, and in order to meet all the guidelines put forth by the state, we need small class sizes. I mean, we should always have small class sizes, but even more so now. If it's all hands on deck, then it should be all hands on deck. Why would we be getting rid of teachers at a school if the school needs them? We have qualified teachers that want to stay in their schools to teach. Let them for the safety of our staff and students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Costello. That's all I have. All right, thank you all very much. And those of you that made the trip down here to do public comment in person, we appreciate that. Um, for our guests that I know are up next, uh, if you wouldn't mind, we do need to take just a very brief 10 minute recess. Um, for personal needs to be addressed and we will get right to you as soon as that recess is over. It is 10, or excuse me, oh, it's not 10 yet, it's <laughs> 6.53. Um, so we'll be back here at 7.03, thank you.